He was a farmer's son who grew up poor along the canals of northeastern Ohio. As a young man, he dreamed of a life at sea. As an adult, he found success in politics. Americans admired the drive and intelligence that fueled his rise from poverty. And for a time, the scholarly likable James Garfield seemed to embody the American spirit. In the gilded age of Horatio Alger, Garfield was a real-life rags-to-riches hero. There's a great deal of strength in Garfield's life and struggles as a self-made man. The truth is, no man ever started so low but accomplished so much in all our history. Rutherford B. Hayes. He overcame adversity early. He lost his father at age two and went to work at age 16, driving mules along the towpaths of the Ohio and Erie canals. His earnings put him through college in Massachusetts. After graduation, he returned to Ohio, where he took up teaching Latin and Greek and married a former classmate named Lucretia Rudolph. He was an affectionate husband, but then he was amiable by nature, the kind of man given to hugging friends or throwing an arm around a companion's shoulder. He and his wife would have seven children, five who lived to maturity, and he doted on them too. Garfield's affability helped secure his success in the years following his marriage, when his gifted intellect and ambition steered him toward a career in politics. He won a state senate seat in 1859, serving two years before joining the Union Army. In 1862, at age 31, he became its youngest brigadier general. The year also marked his entry into the U.S. House of Representatives. He was a principled politician. At the outset of his first candidacy, he'd said he wanted to avoid what he called, quote, the mire into which politicians usually plunge. But that didn't stop his name from being connected to scandal when during the Grant administration he was accused of accepting an illegal bribe. His career suffered little, though, and in 1880, Ohio citizens elected him to the U.S. Senate. He never assumed the office, however. A surprise nomination that year at the Republican convention put him on a path to the presidency instead. He and his running mate, Chester Arthur, won the election of 1880, but it had been a bitter campaign, and Garfield took small pleasure in the victory. Things only got worse once he took office, when unyielding job requests and struggles over patronage left him bewildered. He called the presidency a bleak mountain, Mrs. Garfield was also suffering. Two months into her husband's term, she fell ill with malaria, and soon thereafter left Washington to recuperate at a seaside resort in New Jersey. Garfield was on his way to visit her on July 2nd, 1881, when a disgruntled job seeker named Charles Guiteau shot him in the back. The president had been strolling through a Washington train station, arm in arm with his secretary of state, James Blaine. Severely wounded, Garfield lingered through the summer, during which Americans hung on every piece of news relating to his condition. Some even stopped by the White House to offer home remedies. In what were unsuccessful efforts to locate the bullet, doctors probed his wound with unsterilized instruments. An inventor, Alexander Graham Bell, scammed the president's body with a new contraption designed to detect metal. Finally, on September 19, 1881, Garfield died. He was 49 and had served in the White House 199 days. The people are responsible for the character of their Congress. If that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, it is because the people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. If it be intelligent, brave, and pure, it is because the people demand these high qualities to represent them. James A. Garfield. James A. Garfield. He was elected in 1880, inaugurated in March of 1881, and just a few short months later became the second American president to be assassinated. Today we'll learn about the life and times of President James A. Garfield from his family home here in Menor, Ohio. 
We have a full lineup of guests today who have studied this man and can be part of our discussion. Dr. Alan Peskin, who is history professor at Cleveland State University and the author of a biography called Garfield. And Dr. John Shaw, professor emeritus of English at Hiram College and the editor of Crete and James, the personal letters of Lucretia and James Garfield. And you'll meet Suzanne Miller, who is acting site manager of the Garfield National Historic Site. As always, your telephone calls are important to us. We hope you'll join in our conversation about James A. Garfield, and here's how you do it. If you live in the Eastern and Central Time Zones, 202-624-1111. If you live in the Mountain or Pacific Time Zones, 202-624-1115. And we're today going live from inside the family home on the second floor in what became the Garfield Family Library. And let me begin with Dr. Alan Peskin. Set the political stage for us here in 1880 as uh, Garfield was nominated for the presidency. Well, Garfield didn't expect to be nominated for the presidency in 1880. Um, in fact, he served as the floor manager for John Sherman, the Ohio senator. Garfield had just been elected to the Senate and expected to serve out his term there. But the Republican Party was badly divided. It was actually in between generations. It had fought the Civil War. The causes for which it had fought the Civil War were pretty much won. Now it had to redefine itself. And it, so the choice was turning back to Grant and redoing the old battles of Civil War and Reconstruction, or turning to a younger man and a new generation. And Garfield emerged out of the convention as a surprise compromise candidate um, after 36 ballots. That's hard for us to imagine today, 36 ballots. Was it a cliffhanger all along the way? All the way. Um, the, um, the Grant people kept their lines firm, but they could never quite get the majority. Uh, the anti-Grant people tried one candidate, then tried another candidate, and nobody could seem to break the deadlock. So that Garfield, who was acceptable to everybody, uh, and had a man who was a man with virtually no enemies, uh, was the surprise. Uh, Victor. Dr. John Shaw, you've spent a lot of time with personal papers of this man. Tell us uh, what you've learned about his characters and quality that he was a man that nobody disliked. Well, he was a man that had many friends. He made friends uh, when he was in his uh, uh, first years of school at, in uh, Chester, Ohio, and then at Hiram, the Eclectic Institute. And those friends stayed with him throughout his lifetime. They were very close friends, and uh, he depended on them uh, for political advice. He depended on them for his emotional outlets, and uh, people loved him. He had a charisma that uh, attracted people. He was robust. He gave people bear hugs. Uh, he was a very social animal. Before we take our first call, and I know people are anxious to be part of this conversation, I want to talk a little bit about Menor, Ohio, which is where we are today. Very busy street out front, but the campaign of 1880 for the Republicans was largely conducted from this site. Can you talk about it? Presidents weren't supposed to campaign. Uh, it was the one office in the country that was supposed to seek the man. Uh, so the presidents were supposed to stay in relative seclusion. They didn't go around the country whistle-stopping. Those few pres presidential candidates who did paid for their temerity by being defeated. But Garfield invented a novel way of campaigning without campaigning, uh, which was later called the Front Porch Campaign. He stayed at home here in Mentor and uh, worked on the farm in well-publicized rustic simplicity. But there was nothing to stop people from coming to him. So every day, delegations of uh, well-wishers would come to Garfield, uh, and he'd welcome them to his home. Uh, say a few words, time to make the evening newspapers, and then bid them on, uh, on their way. And so he was not campaigning, but he made the headlines and made the news the way he wanted. It was a tactic that was adopted by subsequent candidates all the way uh, down to Warren G. Harding. We can see the front porch of the house, which has been a very important part of uh, the refurbishment efforts here, but very different because it's now a busy street. At the time, this was such a big expanse of grass, it was actually nicknamed Lawnfield. Lawnfield was the name that the newspaper reporters gave uh, to the home. Uh, they felt that a presidential home should have some grand name, and uh, Garfield himself never called it that, but he, he went along with the joke. 
And from that time uh, on, the family called it Lawnfield. We're going to learn lots about this site, which is uh, it is co-managed by the Western Reserve Historical Society and the National Park Service. And you can come visit. And as our program progresses, we'll tell you how you can visit and what you'll see here. Let's take our first call on James A. Garfield. It's from Sacramento. Good morning. Uh, good morning. I'm calling uh, about his uh, religious life. I understand that Garfield uh, was a member of the Disciples of Christ and served as an elder and that uh, he made the statement uh, when he became president that he stepped down from the lofty office of an elder to assume the presidency of the United States. Um, I'll take my call off the air. Thank you. Garfield was more than an elder. He was an ordained preacher. Uh, he wasn't even a lay preacher. He was ordained by the state of Ohio and in the Disciples of Christ or the what was then called the Campbellite denomination, which was actually a very radical denomination for its time. And Dr. Shaw, as his life progressed and his conversations with his wife, did they speak of spiritual issues often in their letters? Yes, they did. Um, not often, but it's interesting that when James was at Williams College uh, in the uh, mid-1850s and Lucretia was back in Hiram, they'd become engaged. And one of the things they did as an uh, engaged couple at that time was attempt to read the same passage of Psalms at the same time. And uh, the letters would uh, very often say, well, I was reading this Psalm and I got the number wrong and so on. And then later on in their, in their life, I think uh, they were church going. And uh, uh, Lucretia depended much on James for discussions of Christian uh, various Christian principles. Although it should be pointed out that Lucretia was not the only woman that Garfield was reading the same psalms to every day, uh, not at least when he was going to college. Yeah. And what does that mean? Oh, that means that uh, it was very, attract very attractive to women. Uh, they seemed to flock of, uh, to him. Uh, Would it be fair in today's parlance to call him a ladies' man? No, because uh, he was a man of rigid principles that so far as I know only bent once maybe twice. Um, no major scandals there. He did not really love his wife until well into marriage, would you say, John? Yes, I would say that uh, he fell in love with his wife in about 1865, and uh, seven her. years seven. after the marriage. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we'll, we'll actually hear some of the passages where you show some of the ups and downs of their relationship in the letters. Let's take another call. Columbus, Ohio. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I really do enjoy your series, and also I'm a teacher, and I can't wait till this fall to I can get my students involved in your president's contest, so that should be a lot of fun for them. Well, thanks. What uh, grade do you teach? I teach fifth grade. And how interested are your students in history? Well, I have my students doing um, president's reports last year, videotaping them, and they loved it. And, um, you know, teaching fifth grade, you have to teach the um, United States history. So I definitely well, get them involved in that. We look forward to their entries. Uh, let me uh, go ask you to go ahead with your question as you called in this morning. Thanks. Well, actually, my question goes with what the um, two gentlemen were talking about, and that is the rumors of a Mrs. Calhoun. Is that a rumor or is that the truth? And um, I'll go ahead and hang up and listen to your answer. John Shaw? Yes, that is the truth, I'm afraid to say. Uh, there who, was who was Mrs. Calhoun? <laughs> Mrs. Calhoun was a widow who uh, I think James met uh, in New York probably, I would say, in uh, 1864 or 1863 uh, at uh, Whitlaw Reed's home, I would suspect, since uh, she was a newspaper uh, writer and uh, he was an editor from Ohio and a friend of Garfield's. Okay, Garfield met her and fell in love with her um, during, I think, during the early months of 1864. Her name was Lucia uh, Garfi uh, Calhoun. Uh, and James had to come home later as the rumors got round and confess to his wife that uh, this had happened. He did this in June of 1864. Uh, later on, he, he broke the affair off, and in 1867, he got the letters that he had written to her uh, returned to him and destroyed them. And that is probably the main reason that we know about the affair, and that he does mention the 
letters, and there were rumors in 1864 about the affair. Alan Peskin, let's go back in time. Would you talk about Garfield's birth? Where was he born and what were the circumstances? Born in the ideal place for a president to be born. He was born <laughs> in a log cabin. And where? The log cabin was in what is now Moreland Hills in Ohio, but uh, was then the township of Orange, uh, outside of Cleveland, perhaps 20 miles. Very hilly, rugged area, not very good farmland. Um, his father had built that cabin. Um, his mother and his uncle, who lived next door, worked the land, but they owned their own land. They were poor, but uh, not at the, in the depths of poverty, like uh, Andrew Johnson, for example. Uh, they owned their own land, free and clear. Uh, they had uh, a few debts, and then his father dropped dead uh, when he was only two years old, leaving the widowed mother to uh, take care of family and, and farm, which she did. Um, although she remarried much to uh, Garfield's humiliation because he tried to bury any, uh, any reference to that because his mother did remarry and then divorce, which was a terrible scandal then. Um, but she got along. She, she was a very tough woman. Uh, she kept the family together and made sure also that James not only went to school but was baptized, which was very important to her. Next calls from Rochester, New York. Yes, uh, thank you for having me on your program. It's a wonderful program. Thanks, uh, my question is uh, regarding the relationship between Garfield and Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, in preparation for your grant program two weeks ago, I read the biography of Grant by Jeffrey Perret. He makes several statements about Garfield. Apparently, he and Grant hated each other. And uh, this started during the Civil War when Garfield was on the uh, staff of General Rosecrans. Uh, and then Grant at the Battle of Chattanooga relieved Rosecrans, and Garfield didn't like that. And then apparently when Garfield went back to Congress and uh, Grant's mentor Washburn was trying to uh, pass a bill for uh, the lieutenant generalship, three stars for Grant, uh, Garfield was the leader of the opposition for that. And, but but it, he got, Grant got his star anyways. And then apparently uh, there there was just a lot of uh, bad feeling between the two. Uh, I think he, Garfield investigated Grant during the uh, gold panic, and he didn't uh, uh, exonerate Grant. Uh, but uh, apparently, Gar uh, according to Je Jeffrey Prey, uh, Garfield was involved in a lot of the corruption and bribery, too. And uh, it, Grant, Garfield thought Grant was not fit to be nominated, and Gr Grant hated Garfield and his... Uh, cronies, and he called them the impractical damn literary fellow. Well, you're getting a bit of a shaking head here about some of your information, so let's well, find out what our guests... My question is, what do your historians think about this viewpoint of Garfield? You're about to find out. Thanks. Thanks for your call. It was an amb ambivalent relationship. Uh, Garfield respected Grant, but they were rivals. Garf uh, during the Civil War, uh, in, during the times you mentioned, uh, Grant, uh, Grant represented the West Point branch of the army, and Garfield represented the volunteer soldiers, and there was always tension uh, between the two groups. Uh, Garfield and Grant were not temperamentally akin, but when Grant left office, Garfield gave him a eulogy in his diary, said that no man carries away from the White House greater dignity than the little man who leaves it now. Then, of course, they would be rivals again for the nomination in 1880. Uh, Politicians do not always love each other, um, but they respected each other in this case. But Dan, um, Grant did campaign for uh, Garfield, Grant and he came to this house. Came to this house, know? had a cup of tea that yeah. uh, Lucretia poured for him, uh, <laughs> so that it wasn't all uh, antagonism. And this house, again, is in Menor, Ohio. It is spelled M-E-N-T-O-R, pronounced locally without the T, Menor, Ohio. <laughs> and it is on Route 90, the Interstate 90, about 20, 22 miles east of Cleveland. And it's a pretty easy drive on the interstates if you're coming this place to, uh, this way to visit from out of state. And we're talking about James A. Garfield. What's the A stand for? Abram. And where did the Abram come from? Came from uh, his father. And that was his father's first name? Yes. And the name had been in the family time after time. Next call is from Ashtabula, Ohio. Hello. Um, I'm basically, I wanted to call and ask about the room and the actual corner of the structure you're in. Um, and I Actually, I had two-parter, but uh, most of it you probably answered already, dealing with the uh, history of Garfield in the military. Um, 
Did you possibly elaborate on some of the areas of battle, if he was in battle or not? I have no idea. Um, but the area, I understand the area or the section of the house that you're in right now was not part of the house when he was alive. And it was uh, a dedication, if I'm not mistaken. And also, if uh, what your feelings basically are with the carriage house, I'm, I'm kind of a person who uh, is, is very uh, interested in, in uh, seeing the way things are when they were actually in use versus how they were changed over for educational purposes. And I did have the opportunity to see the carriage house um, while it was in construction, and, uh, or reconstruction, I should say, for the educational purposes. And I'll hang up. Thank you. Thank you. A little bit later we'll talk to Suzanne Miller who is the manager here and she can talk about uh, what the uh, historian's goal was in the recent restoration of the site. Uh, some figures as high as 10 to 12 million dollars in a number of years. We'll have to, to make sure that's correct. But a number of years in doing this all over and just opening it again last year. But let me ask you about this house when Garfield bought it. What was it like? Run down. Um, he got it cheap because of that, but the place was a mess. Uh, there was a pigsty right under, this, under the window, the bedroom window, and when the wind was right, you could tell that. Um, he worked very hard on it, uh, but he hardly lived in it. Uh, they bought it in the late 70s, about 76, 77, and it wasn't really fixed up uh, in a decent state until the summer of 1880 to serve as a campaign headquarters. Then he went off to Washington got shot, never came back. So that uh, the house is more his wife's house, his widow's house, and this particular room was added well after his death. And this is uh, a library and it really well appointed. Many of the books in this room here are the original Garfield uh, books in the family collection. And behind us is a vault which was added by Lucretia Garfield which contained the presidential papers. One of the early preservations, I understand, of mm -hmm. presidential papers. Do you know more about that? Uh, well, Rutherford uh, B. Hayes had uh, started the idea of presidential libraries, presidential collections, uh, at, on a private basis, not government supported, and Lucretia Garfield did much the same. Uh, Garfield never threw anything away. Uh, there's overdue library notices in his papers. Don't historians mm -hmm. love that when presidents <laughs> never throw anything away? It's good on one hand, but on the other hand it means an awful lot of work. Uh, now it's available on microfilm, but it's 177 reels of microfilm, which the family very graciously gave to the Library of Congress. Both of our guests have books that are still available about Garfield, and let me show them to you so you can, uh, those of you who are reading some of the biographies and following along, this is Dr. Alan Peskin's book called Garfield. Uh, who published it? Kent State University Press. And how long was it in the making for you? <sighs> My wife would say much too long, but uh, on and off. 10, 15 years. And why are you interested in him as a subject? I think for all the wrong reasons at first, uh, because he hadn't been done in a long time and because the papers were available. And it was only when I got deeply into the project I realized what a remarkable man he was and how it was worth doing because uh, he's the pivotal figure in his generation. What made him remarkable? Versatility. He was a college president, a general, a preacher, a politician who never lost an election, uh, even in college, um, and everything that he did, he did well. Uh, he started his legal career, for example, at the top. Uh, his very first case that he tried was in the U.S. Supreme Court. He never tried a lower case before that. Uh, and yet he started from nothing. Self-made, ideal Horatio Alger character. Horatio Alger even wrote his biography. And this is John Shaw's book, which is called Crete and James. While I show it, tell our viewers the story of this book. Well, I had written a play uh, for Garfield's 150th uh, birthday and 100th anniversary of his inauguration. And in that, during the research for that, I came across the letters, uh, particularly the personal letters exchanged between James and Lucretia. I had no idea of how beautiful that group of letters might be. And as an English teacher, I saw in them the story of a marriage, really. It's a, an epistolary novel that has a beginning, middle, and end. And I just felt that they had to be published as a, uh, a kind of social 
history of marriage in the uh, Western Reserve and in the 19th century. What's the phrase Western Reserve mean? That's a section of Ohio. Um, I think Alan better answer that better than I can. Okay, yes. very quickly. When the Constitution was adopted, all the eastern states that had claims to the uh, Trans-Appalachian West had to give up their claims and throw it into the common pot, the public domain. But Connecticut tried to hold out or to reserve some of its land in the West to compensate its citizens who had lost uh, in the Revolutionary War. So the lands they reserved in the West became the Western Reserve. That is the northeastern corner of the state of Ohio. The book Cretan Janes is still in print as well, and you all can buy it at your local bookstore. It is available through Michigan State University Press. And if you'd like a sample, we have one of the letters between uh, Lucretia and James on our website, so you can get a sense of what their prose is like. And you can find it, you see it on your screen right there, at our American Presidents website. It's www.americanpresidents.org. And while you're looking, let's take our next call. It's from Kemmerer, Wyoming. Uh, good morning, Susan. Good morning. Uh, I'm the first time caller, and uh, I really enjoy C-SPAN, and particularly your program as well as uh, uh, Brian's program. Um, I, uh, I, I have one question from the professors over there. I wanted to ask them, uh, was there a particular conspiracy to get rid of this man uh, or because he was of his Christian background or very sound fundamental um, a belief system, or was it just a rogue gunman that just gunned him down out of... Alan Peskin. God told him to do it. <laughs> uh, so if there's any conspiracy, it was just between Charles Julius Coteau and the Lord. Um, but Coteau awoke one morning and decided that there was terrible pressure on him that God was telling him that for the good of the Republic, James A. Garfield had to be removed. Uh, so uh, he bought himself a pistol and taught himself how to shoot and then went out to remove him. Can I say a word about Coteau? Please. Okay. He's always called the, uh, a disappointed office seeker, but uh, that's not really a good description of him. Uh, he was really a religious fanatic. The office that he was looking for was uh, Minister to Paris, Council General to Paris, or Minister to Vienna. Something he wouldn't have been qualified Impossible. for. Impossible. He didn't even own a clean shirt. Um, so that it's not disappointed office seeking. It was the civil service reformers who very cynically turned him into a disappointed office seeker so that they could push for civil service reform. Actually, uh, one reason that he shot Garfield was to uh, stimulate interest in his book. Uh, he thought it would promote sales. Um, unfortunately, it didn't. Uh, the nation had lost a president 16 years before through assassination. Why were they not more protective of their presidents? Garfield put it best. He said that assassination can no more be guarded against than death by lightning. And so there was no reason to try to, uh, try to stop it. Besides, Americans believed that assassination was only done in despotisms like Russia, uh, where that was the only way you could get rid of your ruler. In a democracy, if you wanted to get rid of him, you just voted him out. But they didn't take into account uh, that there are certain deranged individuals who didn't have the patience for that. Um, ultimately, there would be civil, uh, secret service, but it would be a long, long time in coming. Clausen, Michigan, you're on the air. Hi, great show here. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add to that last comment that uh, also Garfield was a, a great opponent of the bank system, like Andrew uh, Jackson. and. My question is, I wanted to know a little bit about Garfield's brothers, uh, such as Thomas, and the fact that when Garfield was a general, he had a cousin uh, who was captured by the South and in uh, uh, Libby Prison, and uh, if you could comment on that uh, to your best uh, degree. All right, thank you for your call. Would you mind picking up with his first comment about the bank system? Bank system, uh, Garfield... Uh, and Jackson didn't have very much in common there. Jackson wanted to get rid of the National Bank. Uh, Garfield wanted to strengthen it. Garfield's great belief was in a stable currency uh, without inflation. Uh, in that, he was very much like Jackson, who wanted uh, specie, that is only gold and silver, uh, but Garfield also wanted paper money. As far as the relative being captured by the Confederacy, uh, I must have missed that because uh, that, that's 
uh, something I never encountered. I want to go back again in time at uh, John Shaw and his history and have you talk about a place that is important to James Garfield and also to you, Hiram College. We're going to All show right. some videotape of Hiram College. Talk about the association with it and Garfield. Well, James went to Hiram in its uh, first year of existence in 1850, and it was a, uh, a small uh, college founded by the Disciples of Christ uh, on a mountaintop or a hilltop in uh, northeastern Ohio, and it had one building, and James uh, entered as a kind of farm boy going to that school, dressed in overalls, uh, a poor boy who uh, couldn't get enough of learning. He was a an exceedingly fine student. He worked and worked and soon was teaching classes in uh, Greek and Latin. And uh, the college uh, continued. It was not uh, a, uh, an official college until the 1870s, I think. Um, and James uh, always kept his connection with the college. He uh, taught there. He became a president there or the head uh, faculty member there, and then he was on the trustees, and uh, Hiram was always the closest to his heart of uh, any one spot on earth. We saw some modern day scenes at Hiram College. Is his presence still felt as a, a favorite son of the school? Well, his house is, uh, the house that he lived in is uh, still there. Uh, that's it, and uh, he lived there for a number of years. They bought the house. Uh, in the 1860s and then uh, sold it to Burke Hinsdale who later became the president of the college. Uh, now in that house uh, one of the uh, collateral descendants of Garfield is living, uh, Phoebe Zimmerman. And if you would explain Dr. Peskin about about Garfield as a teacher, I've had a, a few experiences of current teachers who are excited about this man because they feel he's one of their own. How important was being a teacher to him? Everything that Garfield did was important to him because he worked so hard at it. Uh, but teaching was not really a profession in those days. It was something usually that young boys did uh, when they, during the break, when they were going to college, they'd take a couple of months off, teach, earn enough to go back to college. The first thing you had to do was to be able to beat up the biggest boy in the class. That established your intellectual authority over, over the group. But it was a one-room schoolhouse uh, so that with about 40 students, there was a wide range of problems. Some of his students, for example, uh, were still not were still in diapers, or the 19th century equivalent of diapers. And in the same classroom, two other students eloped, uh, which gave a pretty wide range of discipline and learning problems in one classroom. He solved them, but he worked very hard at it. He'd stay up at night. He'd picture to himself the layout, the physical layout of the classroom. Here's where this student sits. What's his problem? Here's, here's another one. What, what can I do for her? Um, he took it very seriously. He also, uh, he continued his teaching uh, all through his life with, to his family and uh, at, uh, at meal table, at, at uh, meal times. He would uh, hear the lessons of his uh, two older boys, and he was uh, wanting them to uh, uh, write an essay each week for him, which uh, uh, he would read and comment on. And uh, he kept the classics going in his family. Which must have been intimidating, because he would ask them to recite uh, Virgil, which they had just been studying, and he'd correct them out of his memory, and he hadn't looked at it for decades. We are again on the second floor of the Garfield home in Menor, Ohio, east of Cleveland. And we have a camera with our colleague John Kelly, which is going to show you some of the rooms of the house. And remember, as you're looking at the scenes from the home, that it is depicted in its zenith in the years following Garfield's death that was restored to represent the period from 1880 through 1905. We're going to look at the front room on the first floor as we listen to a call from Chautauqua, New York. Yes, I'm very pleased to have a chance to... Uh, discuss Garfield with you folks in that uh, I'm a graduate of Garfield High School. Uh, and uh, my question pertains to Garfield's uh, activities on the uh, Ohio and Erie Canal that runs the, uh, in, in his day it ran the uh, uh, length of the state from uh, north to south from the Ohio River up to Lake Erie. And I understand that he was a, a mule boy 
on the canal uh, called uh, Haji, and I just uh, wondered if uh, he had any interesting experiences uh, in that line of work, and I'll hang up and listen. Well, he almost drowned. That's kind of an interesting experience, uh, particularly since he didn't know how to swim, and he was extremely clumsy. Uh, he fell in the, in the canal, by his estimate, 16 times <laughs> and was fished out each time. Uh, actually, he was only on there for about six weeks, came home, not surprisingly, uh, with a terrible fever and the ague, as it was called in those days, uh, shivered and shook for a couple of weeks until his mother got him off the canal and into school. But the Canal Boy episode served as a great uh, political background uh, for his uh, poor boy to uh, president uh, saga. John Shaw, when you read his letters, was the, creation, was the, the image of a poor boy a, a simply a political creation or was it something in his private uh, conversations with his wife that he reflected on? Yeah, it was very much uh, in his mind. Uh, it was a, gen a genuine feeling he had. Uh, there is one uh, quite uh, notorious letter, I should say, in which he uh, complained about uh, his poverty and, and uh, what difficulties he, he had. Uh, getting to where he was, whereas other people that he had met at Williams College and later on in life had had all of the uh, various luxuries and had not had to struggle the way he did. And his wife replied and said, shame on you for writing a letter like that. Uh, you should be uh, uh, grateful for what you have experienced and what it's done for your character. Let's take a phone call and then next we'll uh, learn a little bit more about Lucretia. Crete. Uh, Rudolph, is it Rudolph or Randolph? Her first Rudolph. Rudolph Garfield, uh, his uh, wife and her character and her influence on him. Next call is from Sardinia, New York. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, uh, Mr. Peskin. It's been a few years since we spoke together. Uh, Glenn Mueller, a uh, oh, yes. reenactor who does uh, James mm -hmm. A. Garfield. Oh, and, still doing uh, it? Enjoyed it greatly. Um, we did Are you into, still portraying James Garfield? I sure am. My wife and I do James and Lucretia from uh, memory. In fact, uh, when they reopened the home there, James R. asked uh, Edna and myself if we'd come down and be Grandma and Grandpa. And what a, what that an was interesting experience. An <laughs> but uh, some of the great things that have happened, that little, little is known about them, uh, in the uh, tramping over from Williams College, over just east of Troy, New York, in Poston Kill, where he carried a six-week campaign for the church that's there, and we went to the area, and also to where he taught penmanship up in Eaglemere on the same road, and he used to walk that, usually taking his boots and throwing them over his shoulders so he wouldn't wear them out and get a ride every once in a while from someone coming over with a wagon. They knew who he was, and uh, it was great to be there. Also down in the little town of Mooresville, just outside of Decatur, Alabama, when he was on uh, duty, uh, rebuilding bridges and railroads down there during the Civil War. We got to the uh, church in Mooresville, where he preached, was asked to preach July 6, 1863. And the book is still there that he signed, the Bible is there, the uh, speaker stand, all the, everything is original there, and the congregation is still going and still active. And it was just great to, to be there. It was, even now I get goosebumps thinking about it. Well, thank you for adding that. Do you have a question based on all your study? Yes. Um, James Garfield? Um, I was trying to find out who it was that actually messed up his campaign at Chickamauga uh, when General Rosecrans got word that uh, there was an opening in his line. I couldn't find who that was. It was not a, um, a general. I think it was a general's aide, and maybe Mr. Peskin can help me out on this because uh, we've got a, a reenactment coming up, and I want to have my correct uh, information. <laughs> Thank and, you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> okay. We appreciate the call. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I could, too, but uh, the name just slipped my mind. It it's wood? in the book somewhere, but I'd have to look it up. It's not uh, Wood. J yes. Wood. Colonel Wood. Colonel Wood. Colonel wood. Yes. And uh, he deliberately misinterpreted or perhaps... Uh, literally interpreted an order that should have been in interpreted with a uh, certain amount of leeway because he had been chewed out by Rosecrans a, f a few weeks before for not obeying orders blindly. Um, but the order itself was badly drawn and uh, I tell my students it shows that, it, that grammar does matter. Uh, with uh, a confusing order, 
Hundreds of people were killed, a battle was lost, and the war was almost lost. Uh, there's a moral there somewhere for any of you who are teachers of English here, but uh, I'll let you draw it. Well, having a teacher of English and literature right next to you, that's probably uh, good news for you about grammar mattering so much. Let, let me move to Lucretia Garfield. We have a, a portrait of her hanging in a hallway downstairs, and I'd like to have you talk about her character and her influence on James Garfield. Her character was exceedingly strong. Uh, she had a rectitude that was uh, invulnerable. Uh, a very, very uh, strong-willed and uh, principled woman. Uh, in the early years, I think James found her a little bit uh, distant and cold, and uh, her rectitude was not quite uh, what he had hoped to find. Uh, but as the years went by, she had a tremendous influence on him. She was the uh, ideal wife, uh, ideal mother, and he saw her then in the later years as a uh, as a powerful uh, force for his own uh, career. And they together had how many children? They had seven children together, two of whom did not survive. Next telephone calls from Charleston, South Carolina. Hello. Good morning. Nice program. I'm really enjoying this. Uh, I want uh, the gentleman to talk a bit more about uh, about Garfield as a disciples minister. Did, did he make his living as a minister? Um, or was he sort of just an itinerant guest type preacher? Uh, did he know Alexander Campbell? Did he know Walter Scott? Uh, he, uh, Professor Pesky mentioned the, the sort of radical nature of the disciples movement in the West. I, I'd, like, I'd like, like you to expand a bit more on that and um, Garfield's role in National City Christian Church. Uh, I'll hang up and listen, and I'm enjoying this very much. Thank you. Well, he didn't make a living as a minister, but very few people did. Uh, he didn't have a congregation of his own. He did preach at various uh, churches around uh, not only the Western Reserve, but as a previous caller pointed out, even when he was in the army down south. Uh, primarily, though, the his ministry uh, was exercised through the, uh, the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute, now Hiram College, uh, which was a disciple uh, academy or college. Um, and denominational schools in those days always had uh, ministers as their presidents. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it did tie in with his career. Uh, he tended to drift away from uh, a formal ministry once he entered politics, because partly because the disciples didn't believe in politics. That was part of their radicalism. They didn't believe in voting. They didn't believe in uh, taking a, uh, part in what they called the carnal affairs of the world. Uh, they were uh, millennialists uh, and lit bi biblical literalists, but they were also very radical, and it was uh, it was liberating to be baptized. It was liberating to be able to change your destiny by an act of will. I don't think that uh, this was a conservative movement at all. Uh, all of the reforms of the 19th century are tied in with evangelical Christianity. It's uh, far different from the, from the rap that it gets now as being a conservative movement. Next telephone call, and as we listen, once again, we'll show you a room in the house. This is a room that was used by Garfield's mother, Eliza, who mm -hmm. lived in this house with them. And did she also yes. go to the White House? Yes. She went to the White House and lived with yes. them there as well. We'll look at Eliza's room on the first floor of the Garfield home and we'll listen to Gainesville, Florida. Hi, Susan. I just want to thank you and Brian and all of C-SPAN for this wonderful series. And I was just wondering if your guests could run through what happened from the time Guto shot Garfield to when he actually died and how that some of the people who tried to save him might actually have helped to kill him. And I just want to listen to your answer. Uh, could, just a clarification. Some of the people who tried to save Garfield or some of the people who tried to save Gateau? Garfield. Garfield. Uh, uh, his okay. medical doctors. Yeah. Uh, it's possible that uh, Garfield didn't exactly profit by his encounter with his doctors. But remember that the one thing that uh, medical doctors knew how to do 
in post-Civil War America was to treat gunshot wounds. Most of them had been in the army and they had handled that uh, and they knew much about it. Uh, I don't think there was anything that could have been done. The uh, bullet nicked Garfield's spine, which would have left him paralyzed even if he had recovered, uh, formed an aneurysmal sac, uh, which ultimately broke and killed him. Uh, even if they had found the bullet, they couldn't have removed it. It's true that they didn't help it matters much by poking and probing into the wound uh, with the unwashed fingers, just sticking it in, trying to find the bullet. Uh, but I don't think they hurt him that much either because I think the wound was fatal uh, from the day one. How many months did he linger? He lingered for um, 80 days. Uh, from July 2nd to September 19th, was it, John? September 19th, 19th. Uh, Chickamauga Day. The anniversary, yeah. Um, there's an interesting thing, too. I think Guiteau, in his defense, unless I'm mistaken, uh, Guiteau argued that the doctors had killed him, that he hadn't killed him. He, he was said, not successful in said, that as a defense. He said, though. I simply shot at him. The, Garfield, <laughs> the doctors killed him. <laughs> what was Guiteau's fate? Uh, he was hanged. Um, went to... Uh, went to uh, execution singing a hymn that he had just written. Uh, I'm going to the Lordy. During the four months that Garfield lingered, much of that time in Washington, D.C., first of all, there were two uh, inventions connected with his uh, convalescence. Would you talk about those? Okay, one uh, was something like air conditioning. Uh, it wasn't quite air conditioning because it didn't remove the humidity, but uh, there was uh, hundreds of yards of toweling that was saturated with ice water and there was ice t uh, in, the, uh, in the bucket and the towels uh, held it and then fans blew air across it. So it cooled the room off but it added to the humidity. It didn't really condition the air but it did cool it and Washington in July can be uh, uh, a real nightmare. So some have claimed that that was a precursor of air conditioning and the other, though, I'm thinking of is uh, Alexander, Alexander Graham, Bell. Graham Bell's uh, metal detector, in which he, he uh, Graham Bell invented uh, a device to find the bullet, sort of like a uh, uh, metallic dowsing rod. You'd hold it over the body, and it would move. Unfortunately, the springs of the bed were made out of metal too, so they uh, kept getting false readings. Never found the bullet, and just as well because removing it would have killed him. I've got a quick question because I've got two callers waiting, but that is that four months when he was convalescing, how closely was his progress watched by the nation and how did the news get out? This was the most thoroughly covered peacetime news event in American history up to that time, uh, partly because the wire services, the telegraph, uh, partly because nothing else was going on, it was summer. Uh, there were daily, hourly bulletins about the status of his health. And these would not only make the newspapers, but they'd be posted uh, around the country. Uh, it was an obsession, very much a precursor of the uh, Kennedy or Princess Di uh, affairs. Uh, and it was probably the first great media event, at least peacetime media event, in American history. So for people who were watching the last week when we were all, uh, as a nation, getting intensive coverage of the search for John F. Kennedy Jr. We can harken back in history and look at this yeah. period and say it had happened once before. Very, very similar, yeah, in the, in the grieving of the nation and the concern for people, of people for this uh, particular person. What is this photograph right now? That's the White House draped in mourning. And that would have been customary in Victorian times? Oh, yes, yes. And would it that way for Lincoln as well. What other places beside the White House would have mourning cloth on it after his death? Would everyday any place, people? Any place that could be, could be covered. This was not an era that believed that less is more. This was an era that believed in abundance. So that uh, the funeral train that bore him back from Washington to uh, his funeral, which I see is on the, uh, on the monitor right now, the funeral train had black oh, on the locomotive. And all the bright work was painted black. Um, and then, of course, the uh, body, the casket was displayed in a black cataphlog with uh, all sorts of draperies. Uh, I think that might be the funeral cart. Looks that they, like it. That's from the Cle car that, they, that, they uh, that he was carried on from Public Square in downtown Cleveland to Lakeview Cemetery, which is about five miles away. 
everything draped in black with black uh, around the wheels, but unfortunately it was a terrible thunderstorm by the time it got there, and the drapes all got soggy and uh, got caught in the wheels, and it wasn't quite as uh, impressive or dramatic as so that. So the Victorian psyche was one which mourning was, and emotion was openly expressed. Yes, yes indeed, yes indeed. Queen Victoria wrote uh, to Lucretia many uh, heads of uh, state in Europe. Next call is from Ponel, Vermont. Yes, sir. Um, I, I want to thank you for C-SPAN. I live in Pondell, Vermont, and in Pondell, Vermont, there's a village called North Pondell, where James A. Garfield was a teacher for a short amount of time. Pondell, Vermont is just across the state line from Williams College. It's about four or five miles away. After Mr. Garfield left, they hired Chester A. Arthur, who was at that time a student at Union College. I have a, a question. Was the GAR the Grand Army of the Republic political organization, influential in electing um, President Garfield. Did they back him? And I'll uh, hang up now and thank you and uh, listen to hear what you say. Thanks very much. They would have preferred Grant as the candidate, but once Garfield was uh, chosen, of course they backed him because Garfield was one of their own. Uh, and Gar uh, in congressional elections earlier, Garfield had uh, appealed to the GAR uh, Vote the way you shot, he'd, he'd tell them. <laughs> Take down your trusty rifle from the wall and ask them which way it would vote, and it will tell you that it would vote against Southerners, Democrats, and rebels now as it did then, and so on in that vein. We have a, a photograph of James Garfield on the screen right now. I would like to have you talk, both of you, about his personality, uh, and if, if one were to meet him, how big was he? What did he sound like? Was he uh, gregarious or shy? Maybe you can add some, flesh out the picture yeah. of him for us. Well, he had a big head to begin with, a big skull. Uh, he. How tall was he? I, I think he probably six was feet. about six feet. Over, a little yeah. over. Uh -huh. And uh, he was a robust man. He, he was a strong man. He uh, inherited this, I think, from his father and grandfather, who had been very uh, powerful men. Um, but it, it was his hardiness, the, his uh, personality, so uh, charismatic, so outgoing. Uh, he, he again and again uh, confessed that he wore his emotions on his sleeve, that he was too emotional, not logical enough. Uh, he got into trouble with his emotions and uh, he confessed this very often. But he, would, he was the kind of person that everyone would like immediately. They would be drawn to him. What was his communication style like? You been speaking? Um, he of course spoke without a microphone so he was used to projecting. Uh, he talked slowly with a baritone voice that could be heard even through the din of Congress uh, and the din of battle. Uh, was he considered a great orator in his time? He was considered a great stump speaker. Uh, his oratory wasn't quite florid enough to make the ranks of great oratory. Uh, that, that's how Lincoln lost points too. He wasn't considered uh, florid enough or learned enough. Uh, Garfield's style uh, in later life was much like Lincoln's, more like the newspaper style than the rhetorical flourishes of the past. Uh, he spoke uh, with one, his right hand jammed in his pocket and his left, all his gestures with his left hand because he was a very left-handed man. Uh, and people listened uh, because the voice uh, could cut through noise and because he knew how to speak in short but very pithy sentences. Um, and he had a wonderful memory so that he could speak without notes. Politician's gift to have a good memory. Yes. <laughs> Next telephone call, and again, we'll show you some more of the house as we listen to this call. This is called the Summer Bedroom, and it's on the first floor of this home in Menor, Ohio. Grand Saline, Texas, you're next on the air. What's on your mind? Uh, I'd like to ask a question. My name is Gene Conley. I'm very active in the Masonic fraternity, and I know that Brother Garfield, President Garfield, was a member of that fraternity along with 14 other presidents, including George Washington. I just wondered if you could enlighten us any on his Masonic career. Thank you. He was a Mason. Uh, 
and uh, I believe there were Masonic ceremonies after his death. Uh, much of that was for political purposes. Uh, early on in life, he had been opposed to secret societies such as the Know Nothings, uh, so that uh, joining the Masons was something of a break from his earlier opposition to that. He had also been opposed to fraternities, but uh, he took the, uh, the Masonic Order very seriously. I could add to that that um, the Masonic Lodge in Garrettsville, Ohio, which is just four miles from Hiram, um, boasts his uh, uh, membership there. And uh, you can see the room where uh, he sometimes appeared uh, at Masonic meetings. Next telephone call is from Durham, North Carolina. Yes. Go ahead, Durham. Yes, this is Lewis Carver in Durham. And I understand that Garfield was close to both Shermans. And, of course, Johnson surrendered to, J to Sherman here in Durham, Durham. at Bennett Place. And I also understand that his father was the strongest man in five counties and died at an early age. And also that his, uh, also so that his mother was the first mother to attend a, an inauguration. That's right. And I really enjoy your program. The question I wanted to ask is it seems to me that I read somewhere that uh, Garfield had dreamed about being assassinated. And I just wondered what you can tell me about that. I'll hang up and listen. Thank you a lot. He did dream that he was on a canal boat and that uh, Chester Alan Arthur, Alan Arthur it uh, was Alan, not Alan. Chester Alan Arthur uh, was along with him and that uh, there was something about dying and drowning in it. Uh, not exactly about assassination. I had some problems with that, though, because I took it one, I, when I discovered the dream, which was inside a flap in uh, one of the Garfield uh, uh, diaries, I took it to a psychologist in Cleveland who was supposed to also be a history specialist, and I had made an appointment with him, but unfortunately he hadn't told his appointment secretary. And so when I came to the office, she said, uh, can I help you? And I said, well, I'm here about President Garfield's dream. And she said, of course. <laughs> the more I talked, the deeper I got into trouble. And she was starting to reach for a funny looking button on the desk. And I beat it out of there. And I'm not quite sure what the dream means. So, so I'm sorry, I can't a, help you. I've any, never got a that. psychoanalysis no, uh, reading. I think it, in that dream, as I recall, maybe it's from your book uh, or from Margaret Leach's, he, he and Chester Arthur were naked. <laughs> After the canal boat after sank. After the canal boat sank. Yes. And they, well, I can't remember. So <laughs> there, there's more detail on the dream in your book if people want to read about it without, without necessarily an explanation of what it might be. It's mean. in a footnote somewhere, the whole thing. <laughs> We are talking about uh, our 20th president, James Abram Garfield. We are live from his home in Menor, Ohio. It's about 20, 25 miles east of Cleveland. And what would Cleveland have been like, gentlemen, in the 1880s? Been like? Well, it, when Garfield was born, it was a very small town. By the time he died, it must have had, what, 500,000? Pretty close to that. About that, yeah. It was a city and an important city at that time. The canal had helped it and the railroads had helped it. And then Rockefeller had helped it with oil refining. Steel mills were growing up. Uh, much of this was beyond Garfield. He didn't deal too much with the industry, industrial revolution of his day. Um, but Cleveland was a bustling growing town. It had and, its uh, millionaire's row oh, yes. and Garfield was considering moving to Euclid Avenue giving up to a politics. big home there. Yeah. Giving would, up politics, going mm -hmm. into law. Where, where would he have anticipated making enough money to live on millionaire's row? The law. In the law. Yes. Before we take our next call, let me tell the teachers how you can use this and other programs in our American President series. Now, the whole purpose of this is education, whether it's formal in the classroom or for those of us who are a little bit older and learning as we go through life. But if you teach, we have materials available to you free of charge that you can use, lesson plans and other materials to help you use our American President series. Two ways you can find out about it, by telephone, the number 202 626 
202-626-4858. Let me give that to you again. 202-626-4858. Or you can find us on the web, cspan.org backslash classroom. Next call, Honolulu. Welcome. Hi. Uh, I've read uh, both uh, Mr. Peskin's book and uh, Margaret Leach, and uh, I'd like to zero in on the youthful uh, James Garfield and his uh, problems and relationships with women. I was uh, uh, rather surprised at the ups and downs relationship with Crete and uh, Garfield. And on the side, you had Miss Booth uh, looking uh, uh, at Garfield with, uh, with great wonder. And then uh, other times, uh, Garfield is running around the East Coast with Rebecca Selleck, and she's taken him up to meet Mrs. Larned. And I wondered if any of this uh, in any way relates to uh, Bill Clinton's uh, various problems. I might also add one more thing. In 1862, in Mrs. Calhoun, I was wondering, she sometimes is called, identified as a newspaper reporter. And I didn't think that there were probably too many newspaper reporters in the New York dailies of those days. Thank you very much. Mrs. Calhoun uh, wrote uh, uh, for culinary uh, uh, recipes in the, uh, in the New York papers. Uh, after the affair with Garfield, she married a man by the name of Cornelius Runkle, who was a, a uh, lawyer with the New York Times, or the New, whatever the New York paper was then, and she wrote a recipe column in that paper as Mrs. Runkle at that time. So not so, coverage of hard news, so but what really a She didn't cover hard news. Now Mary Clemmer, Mary uh, uh, Clemmer was a reporter who reported the, the uh, convention uh, of 1880. And, and Nellie Bly was... And, and there were several that. others. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's uh, how the term uh, Sob Sisters got started. How's that? Well, these women reporters who would uh, pile on the emotion in their stories. Uh, but uh, The first one, question was about one, his early uh, relationship. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that this was all before he married many of the, uh, all the women except for Mrs. Calhoun uh, that uh, were mentioned by our Hawaii listener who must be in, what, the middle of the night by now? I'm, I'm flattered mm -hmm. that, that, he, that he'd call. Uh, all these women were before his marriage, which I think puts it in a somewhat different plane than the contemporary events you're referring to. We have an Ohio caller next, the town of North Homestead. You're on the air and welcome. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Dale Thomas, and I have a question for uh, Professor Peskin. Whether he thought that uh, James Garfield would have been a, uh, a decent president uh, had he uh, survived his presidency, and also commenting on his uh, possible involvement in the Credit Mobile Air scandal uh, when he was serving in Congress. I'll hang up and uh, listen for his uh, answer. Thank you. Okay. Two long questions that require long answers that I can't really give. But first of all, would he have been a decent president? I'm glad you phrased it that way instead of asking whether he would have been a great president. Because presidents weren't expected to be great in the 19th century. They were expected to you know, wash the dishes, cut the grass, do the housekeeping chores of government, keep things running rather than to make things better. And I think Garfield could have kept things running. Uh, he wouldn't have been a Mount Rushmore candidate because uh, that requires a great crisis. And I don't think that uh, there was a crisis looming in the horizon. But he would have been, as you put it, I think very well, a decent president. Uh, he was a decent man. Uh, a second question, credit mobilier. I'm glad you got that right. It wasn't given the French pronunciation of mobilier. Everybody called it credit mobilier. Uh, was he guilty of uh, taking stock illegally for this very complex transaction, which I wish they'd let me describe in detail on this program, but I'm getting looks that say <laughs> that I can't. Uh, was he guilty of taking stock? Probably. Uh, did he, was he corrupted? by $329? Unlikely. Uh, did he intend to sell himself out? I doubt it. He just, at this moment, needed the money and was persuaded that there was nothing wrong in taking a stock option in a company that had uh, intimate dealings with the U.S. government. Um, by our standards, this was a conflict of interest. 
I'm not sure whether it was legally such in, in the time that he dealt with. Morally, it's another question, who could say? We just want to send people rushing to your book <laughs> to <laughs> find out more available detail. Available in better bookstores everywhere. Let I must see. say, it in, in regard to the credit mobilier, that um, it's always been a disappointment to me that Garfield wouldn't confess that he'd done it. I, I'm sure that, uh, at least I'm relatively sure that he did accept that money, and then uh, he just couldn't bring himself to admit it. He dug a pit of evasions and couldn't really get out of it. And the letters from the period, which you have reproduced in your books, suggest that he was rather demoralized by the whole process. Very of much thought depressed, about leaving right. politics. He did. He he uh, considered in in uh, 1870, 71, um, or maybe slightly after there. At that time, when the Democrats uh, got control of Congress, he was considering going into a law firm. But he was nominated for the presidency, so obviously he put this behind him. Well, he overcame the uh, crises of the 1870s, uh, still toyed with the idea of law later, but remember he was a very young man when he becomes president. He was 50, uh, so that uh, he would have had uh, quite a long post-presidential career um, if, or a long private career if he hadn't gone into the presidency. Our two guests on our set here spending our morning with us discussing James A. Garfield are both teachers by profession. And uh, we're going to talk to a teacher next who teaches a very different grade level, level. Joining us by telephone is Vincetta Duner, who is a second grade teacher at Coventry Elementary School in Cleveland. And that's uh, uh, Cleveland Heights, University Heights, uh, Ohio. It's about 45 minutes away from where we are here in Manor. And Vincetta Duner, most of the people who are grown ups and like history uh, can harken back to an experience as a child where they were inspired by their first uh, love and exposure and experience to history. You're dealing with second second graders. How do you get them interested in history and specifically James Garfield? First, I want to say thank you for inviting me. And I'd like to uh, say a special hello to Alan Peskin. Dr. Peskin was my history professor mm -hmm. at Fenn College in the early 60s. And I'm uh, just delighted to be here today. And your husband's as well. Thank you. You're right. We were both <laughs> in your class together, Bob yes. and I. Um, I have to students, say, by the way, that I'm a Coventry alum. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Excellent. Uh, I don't have a question for uh, the panel, and I know I'm going to speak about my experience, but what I'm going to say, Dr. Peskin, is I am going to invite you to my class. You can come to my class anytime to speak about Garfield, and if you really want to have a thrill, you can come on two field trips. You can come to Lakeview Cemetery, and you yeah. can come to Lawnfield. I'm at Lawnfield every November 19th on his birthday. I accept. Thank you. <laughs> Will you explain how you bring uh, this whole presidency to life for second graders? What is here at this house that intrigues second grade students? Well, I'm going to tell you that um, before the children even set foot in the house, they will have already talked about President Garfield, done research with the help of their parents, done dioramas, they depict a, a part of his life that they're particularly interested in. Perhaps it's when he was a minister or a preacher or when he fell off the, um, into the canal. And we have discussed and done our homework. So then uh, the first phase of our trip is the Lakeview Cemetery, and I think we'll be getting to that later. When they well, come to Lawnfield, All right. it, is, we'll it is the last piece of their uh, Garfield study. They are very, very prepared. And this is where everything comes together. Their favorite room, um, actually they have two favorite rooms. One would be the study, and this is where the black chair is. And uh, the docent, would, Leslie Graham, would say to the children, this room is exactly how President Garfield left it. When he died, Lucretia left it exactly like this. And they look at this chair, and already they're starting to think, this is an unusual chair of the configuration. And Leslie would say to the children, how do you think President Garfield would sit in this chair, or how would you sit in this chair? And already um, the children are engaged. They're not just looking into the exhibit. They feel like they're a part of it. Another room, their very favorite room, is the library. And this room, they uh, look up to the ceiling. I hope you can do a shot of the ceiling. The carvings are magnificent. They look down at the carpets. 
they see his bust in the corner. But more than that, the message of the library, the books, read, read, read. And you can see the children just looking over and trying to see what he was reading. Um, Garfield, who was a lifelong learner, never stopped learning, and uh, with so many things, um, when they peek into the other rooms, they get excited about um, the china that they're told that uh, Lucretia may have hand-painted. They look into the parlor. And when they come into the very uh, first the reception room, this is where it is tradition that there is a poem. And this poem is said by a very special child, different child every year. And the poem was written by a mother. Celia Ryder, for her son Christopher, in honor of President Garfield. The very same poem is recited there. And when we go to Lakeview, we recite it again. And Santa Junior, let me interrupt you because our time is always too short. How about, uh, since you mentioned Lakeview, let's, let's move to that part of your learning process with your students. Lakeview Cemetery is in downtown Cleveland, and it is the site of the Garfield grave. And perhaps uh, we, we'll show some video of it. Perhaps you can talk about how you teach with the Garfield grave. Okay, it's in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. It's within walking distance of Coventry School. And I do a walking landmark tour with my children, and we do local landmarks in the neighborhood, the old schoolhouse. We do um, the first house of Cleveland Heights and Lakeview Cemetery, which is a local and national landmark. When we get to the cemetery, before we even go in, and you're already in the interior, the exterior is there are five panels, five friezes, and the children read those friezes. And it tells the story of President Garfield's life, depicting his life. This, this is on the exterior, where you could see uh, that he was a teacher, and that he was in the Battle of Chickamauga, and that he was a great orator in his inauguration, and then that he was lying in state. There's a unit that I developed called with uh, Jean Basu called Stories in Stone and Glass. And then they go to the interior. Now, let me, uh, let me ask you, because we have to catch up. We just showed the interior on our videotape, and you do have a question for our guests that you've prepared as well. Do you want to move ahead to that? Uh, no, I'm not ready. I'm well, going we don't to go have very much time. <laughs> and I just want you to know that downstairs in the crypt area is a mural that the Coventry students made. So in a very dark area, a somber area, is some lightness and the story of his life. And it's from I Coventry students. Question. And the question would be... Um, I know that his father, I heard Dr. Peskin say that he dropped dead. I thought that there might have been something about a fire, that his father had helped fight a fire. I just wanted some details um, on that. that well, was... thank you. Before she uh, goes, let, let me thank you for all of the preparation you put into this morning's uh, uh, appearance by telephone on our program and for all of the extra details, and especially understanding how it is possible to bring uh, complex uh, issues and people's personalities to life for children as young as second graders. And that's the whole purpose, is to inspire others to do the same thing. So thank you for participating this morning. You're very welcome. And thank you for having uh, been interested in Garfield ever since you had that class. <laughs> 40 years ago? 35 years ago. Uh, father died supposedly after fighting a fire uh, and caught a chill um, and, his, and, uh, and his heart gave out. Um, life was very hard. Uh, life was very physical. Uh, medicine was very bad. Um, and it, it's not surprising that even a man of his strength, uh, which was almost legendary, uh, would succumb. Just picking up with that point, for, for both of you, uh, in our modern age, with all of the advances in medicine and technology, death is, is something we experience with not as much frequency as people did in those times. Children often didn't survive infancy and the like. Perhaps you could talk about death in that time period and how much a part of life it was. Well, I think from what I've read about this, that um, up until the 19th century, death was taken uh, pretty much in stride as something that happened and uh, was accepted and you moved on. But beginning of the 19th century, I think, uh, death uh, created much more trauma for people and uh, the, the uh, uh, death of, of the Garfield's first child, uh, Eliza, called Little Trot. Um, at three years old of diphtheria, um, 
was a tremendous blow to both fa uh, father and mother. Um, they had, I think they'd put the emotional content of their marriage focused very much on this child. And when she died, uh, they were both very bereft. And uh, their letters are most touching that they wrote at that time after her death. Alan Peskin, thoughts on death and the Victorians? Well, Mark Twain, of course, had a wonderful <laughs> <laughs> section of Huckleberry Finn, uh, yeah. you, which you could describe yeah. better than I well, could. Well, it's just that uh, he was present at his own funeral. That, <laughs> which, uh, but uh, yeah. death was ever present. Uh, in, in letters that they would write as uh, college students, they would say of someone, I'm sure he will distinguish himself, and then they would add, if he lives. If he lives. Because it was pretty dicey whether people would uh, uh, live to fill out uh, what was regarded then as you know, uh, the normal span. Uh, and I think John is, is right that the 19th century death was uh, a greater blow, partly because children had begun to be sentimentalized. Um, at, as you can see with the novels uh, and the poetry of the time, uh, Eliza, for example, is named after a Dickens character, mm -hmm. uh, Little Trot, mm -hmm. um, so that sentimentalism made death even more, uh, its sting even greater. Two more calls, and then we take a break. Our uh, next call is from San Diego. Yes, good morning. Um, I'm a black caller, and I've done a little bit of reading up on Garfield, and I found no indication that he would uh, have uh, freed blacks, for example, for bondage and persecution in America. And it, also, I, I didn't see anything that, that would indicate that he was anything other than the status quo on the slave issue. And I'm um, just wondering, in that vein, how could black America have much sympathy for his assassination when he basically presided over a country that was enslaving and killing millions of blacks? And I was wondering, have you seen anything different on his opinion on slavery, for example? And I'll hang up and listen to the answer. Thank you. I feel fought a civil war that he thought was primarily designed to free slaves. Um, and the memory of that stayed with him all his life, even in this home, when a delegation of Fisk College students, uh, Fisk was a black college, uh, came to pay their respects in the uh, uh, front porch campaign, uh, when they sang the spirituals that he had first heard when he was uh, down south in the army. Uh, he literally broke down and cried, and he stood by his fireplace, and he said to this group that even after these years, I would rather have you with me and lose than win the election. Uh, he joined the Republican Party. Was it at, at all connected? Was it a decision because of the Republicans' position on slavery? He broke in some ways with his church for this. The disciples of Christ believed that, that since slavery was mentioned in the Bible, it uh, was a legitimate uh, institution. Garfield did not believe this. Garfield believed that, as he put it before the Civil War, that slavery was one of these gigantic evils that had to be, uh, had to be fought. Um, so to get the idea that Garfield was a supporter of, of slavery or not interested in uh, emancipation how about it? Critical, critical times in his congressional con career when he had the, the chance to vote on issues concerning this. How did he vote? He voted consistently to support the 14th Amendment, to support uh, the 15th Amendment uh, on, on black suffrage. Um, he voted against the Ku Klux Klan bill, uh, against the Klan and the, the Ku Klux Klan bill. Uh, personally, he was not close to very many blacks, um, but politically, he believed that that was the great accomplishment of the Republican Party. And John Shaw, looking at his letters mm -hmm. between uh, he and his wife, Crete, uh, what can you tell us about their discussions on this topic? Well, there's not a lot, but uh, Garfield's uh, letter to Lucretia about the uh, hanging of John Brown, for example, is one in which he expresses the deepest sorrow about this whole situation and his belief that only uh, blood can redeem the nation uh, for the slavery. Uh, and Lucretia has a, a wonderful letter that she writes uh, as she's finishing Uncle Tom's Cabin and she said that a letter from James had just arrived but it would remain unsealed until she could finish this book which was so moving to her 
and uh, created her, uh, uh, made her say that she, like her sisters, no darker than she, uh, must see the end of slavery. Statesville, North Carolina, you're next as we talk about James Garfield. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to thank C-SPAN, first of all, for their wonderful series. Um, I'm Jeffrey Hunter from Statesville, North Carolina, and I have a question. Uh, I, first of all, I'd like to back up what the professor just said uh, about the slavery issue. I'm reading a book now called The Gentleman from Ohio, and uh, it does speak about how in Congress, when the resolution to reconsider the 14th Amendment came up, Garfield spoke strongly about it and about the rights of man, no matter what color they are. Um, my question is, I, from what I understand about Garfield through my reading, uh, he, Ar Arthur was chosen in the Republican convention to appease the Roscoe Conkling political machine, and I was just uh, wondering how they got along um, once elected and how they, what the issues they agreed on and what issues they uh, disagreed on. Thank you. Who was Roscoe Conkling, first of all? Roscoe Conkling was the political boss of New York, and Arthur was one of his uh, Proteges. You describe him as a very flamboyant character. Oh, Conkling is, uh, <laughs> well, the, that picture that, that I see is on the monitor now shows the, that little spit curl that he had carefully arranged on his forehead. Uh, he took boxing lessons so that uh, he could become physically fit. And he was a terrible snob. Uh, mm -hmm. Wouldn't even associate with his son-in-law uh, because he had once worked for a living. That is, he had spent a summer working on his father's railroad. Uh, <laughs> and so he cut his daughter off completely, his only child, uh, because she married a working man and had a flamboyant uh, love affair with uh, Kate Chase, uh, Kate Chase Sprague, the uh, daughter of Sam and P. Chase, who you may have noticed on the $10,000 bill uh, when you last time you used it. Uh, the uh, <laughs> But he was a man of immense ego, and Garf uh, he, uh, he and Garfield uh, clashed partly because of that. Who, who vanquished in the end? Who was the winner of between the two? Garfield was the winner, but by that time he was dead. So that it was a, uh, wasn't much of a victory. Uh, Arthur stayed pretty much loyal to Conkley while Arthur was vice president. Um, and had very little to do with Garfield. I, I've never even seen that they... Uh, met much or corresponded. Uh, vice presidents and presidents until recently were not close chums because the vice presidents were always chosen from the other wing of the party, the losing wing, as sort of an appeasement. So I think as Mr. Dooley put it, the vice president's only job was to inquire daily on the status of the president's health. <laughs> uh, and presidents don't really warm up to people whose only prospect of advancement is if they should drop dead. And of course that happened in this yeah. case and only 200 days after the inauguration Chester Arthur became the 21st president and he will be the subject of our next program from New York. Well we're going to take a little break and when we come back we will be showing you some of the sites you would see as a tourist by visiting the historical center here. Let's give you some perspective. There are about eight acres of ground preserved here. And as we leave the main house and show you some of the buildings on the grounds, that was the campaign headquarters and the windmill, right there behind us uh, on the preserved uh, acreage here is a visitor center. And there are a number of artifacts on display there as well as a video that you can see about the life of James Garfield. And we'll return in about five minutes and show you some of the pieces in the Visitor Center exhibit. We'll be right back then.
to our discussion of James A. Garfield, our nation's 20th president, from his home in Menor, Ohio. We are right now in the Visitor Center, which in the time of the Garfields living here was actually a stables. And I'm going to have you talk to and learn more about this whole property from the woman who is the site manager here. Her name is Suzanne Miller. Well, we've uh, been discussing a, a lot about the life and times of James Garfield, but we'd like to tapple your brain a little bit more about some of the things associated particularly with this site. You just went through a major restoration process. Talk about it, please. Um, it started about eight years ago, the actual physical um, restoration, um, research design development, and all these meetings. And this building was built in 1893 by Lucretia Garfield to replace a barn complex that was situated close to the house. She was trying to turn the farm into a, an estate. So um, this has become a visitor center. It, um, uh, it houses an, uh, an auditorium that uh, where we show an 18 minute video and then in this section that used to be the stalls we have our um, exhibits that cover Garfield's life from the cradle to the grave and then we do have a gift shop in here um, it was um, and then the next phase was a little bit of landscaping and then the final phase was the house which just opened up last June 20th and what uh, was for, you have to talk about the arrangement between you and the National Park Service because there this is a, an unusual site for us we've been to sites managed by historical groups and mm -hmm. sites by the National Park Service but both of you are involved how yes uh, the Garfield family owned this property from 1876 until 1936 in 1936, Lucretia's brother Joe died, and at that point, the children of James A. Garfield seriously considered tearing the house down because it was becoming a financial burden to them. But instead, they decided to give it to the Western Reserve Historical Society, who owned it until 1988, and then they gave it to the National Park Service, hoping that funds would be available to restore the property because it was in dire need of, of some help. So today, the National Park Service owns the buildings and the property, and we, the Western Reserve Historical Society, own the collection, and we administer the site for the National Park Service. Can you give us a price tag on the total restoration project? Total, everything, was about $12.5 million. And where did the money come from? Line item appropriations through Congress. So this is public uh, funds used in the restoration, which means all the more we hope that people will come visit the site. And how much does it cost? How long are you open? We are open year-round, Monday through Saturday, 10 to 5, Sundays 12 to 5. Admission is $6 for adults, $5 for seniors, and $4 for children 6 through 12. We are going to work our way through some of the things you can see on exhibit here. And also, as we talk with Suzanne Miller, we're going to be taking your telephone calls for both her and Dr. Alan Peskin, who remains on our set in the library. Uh, before we take our first call, let's look at this here, which depicts life in Washington, D.C. for the Garfields. Um, this exhibit case holds um, various and sundry things, the most important of which is probably the books, because James and Lucretia may have not been emotional equals, but they were very definitely intellectual equals, and they pass that on to their children. So we have a, a conglomeration of books that range from anything from Virgil to the Science of Wealth and Shelley's poetical works. Uh, Garfield was a, a teacher of ancient languages, and he could speak several other languages besides Greek and Latin. We also have this beautiful writing case in here that belonged to Lucretia, and the stationery was designed by Tiffany. Um, over to the far left, <coughs> excuse me, is um, a wall pocket, possibly made by Lucretia. We don't know what for, but more than likely flowers or some little um, little trinkets that she might have put in there. And again, the Garfields had seven children, and five of the children lived to maturity. Yes, they did. First telephone call during this segment is from Morrisville, Alabama. You're on the air. Yes, I'm struck with the parallels in American presidential politics. Uh, for some examples, um, with no presidential widow's pensions in those days, you mentioned how the house and farmstead was added onto. Did the money come from the credit mobiliere scandal? The two professors indicated that the compromising letters to uh, Mrs. Calhoun had been retrieved. Was there a presidential plumber's unit, or again, was uh, did money change hands? Uh, also, did uh, uh, he confess presidential lust in his heart as a disciple of Christ, like Jimmy Carter, or was this all uh, hushed up? I'd I'd like to have uh, the answers on, you know, follow the money in American politics, and you learn very interesting things. Thank you. Well, thank you for your call. Well, let's talk about this house, because it was a farmhouse, we've learned, when the mm -hmm. Garfields purchased it. And it was really after his death that the major expansion went on. Where'd the money come from? Um, 
as has been mentioned before, the public suffered along with Lucretia while her husband took 80 days to die. And so Cyrus Field, who was the, the man who laid the first transatlantic cable, he was a friend of the family, and he started a subscription whereby the public sent Lucretia their dimes and their nickels, and it eventually added up to about $360,000, which is equivalent to around $6 million today. So she became a very wealthy widow after his death. And in 1882, I believe there was some, some uh, federal funding awarded to the four surviving widows of presidents. And she turned this into an estate for the family to use. Mm -hmm. And did she spend all her time here? Um, she spent all of her time here until she became a little older. And then she built a house in Pasadena and would always spend her summers here. Dr. Alan Peskin in the library, that caller wants to follow the money in the time of Garfield. Do you have anything to add to that? Oh, it was a more innocent time than the, the, uh, the 1990s. I'm afraid he's reading back into uh, the Victorian era, the morals of the present day. Uh, the $329 that he allegedly got from the uh, credit mobilier scandal would not have maintained this, this house very long. It was from the subscriptions of the American public, including school children. Uh, that helped uh, Lucretia survive. And also helped to build his grave, isn't that correct? His grave uh, That was a, a different fund, and that took uh, a lot more money. Um, Lucretia lived here with her children and her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren, died in the 1920s. But before that, had a Pasadena home, which was mentioned by Suzanne, in which she also had the honor of being one of the very first grand marshals of the Rose Bowl parade uh, before she died. Suzanne Miller and I are going to move along to another case inside the Visitor Center here, and it will depict Garfield during his Civil War days. As we do that, let's listen to a telephone call from New York City. Good morning and welcome. Hi, Josephine Fegley. Uh, marvelous series, and thank you so much. My question is for Dr. Peskin. Does he know the name of the New Jersey resort where both Garfields recuperated, uh, one died, unfortunately, um, and did they own property there, or were they in a hotel? Am I on? Yes, you're on. Go ahead, Dr. Peskin. Okay. Uh, the uh, resort was Elberon, New Jersey. Uh, they didn't own property there, but uh, they uh, had the use of this particular cottage, as it was called. The cottage was about 20 or 30 rooms, and that's where he was brought uh, because he thought the ocean breeze would be curative. But within a few days after he arrived there, he died. We can actually show you, and we're going to make a stop later on, but since we're talking about his, uh, his phase right around the corner from us, and we'll take a brief picture of it, is a recreation of his uh, deathbed, essentially, that you've put together here. Yes. What can you tell us about that period in the Garfields' life? Um, he was moved to, um, to New Jersey about two weeks before he died. At his own request? Yes, yes. He was, he, since that was where he was originally intending to go when he was shot, um, himself, his wife, and the doctors all agreed that maybe the sea air would help to revive him. And at first it seemed like it did, but then, then he gradually declined and died at the sea. Dr. Peskin, talking about it being a gentler time, uh, it's hard to imagine presidents packing up and going to the New Jersey shore for a vacation. How could he get away, and what happened to the Congress during the months of August at that time? Congress very sensibly didn't meet in Washington during the summer. Um, but presidents were not surrounded by a cocoon of Secret Service men and flax and all of the apparatus that they have now. When uh, Rutherford B. Hayes wanted to go to Philadelphia to see the uh, Centennial Exposition, he went down to the railroad station, bought a coach ticket, and rode on a train. Sat next to a uh, shoe salesman. Had, says in his diary that he had a nice conversation with him. But he learned a lot, too. Uh, learned a lot more than... Uh, presidents nowadays who are kept in such uh, severe isolation. Uh, so that it uh, wasn't all that difficult for Garfield to travel around. He just went down to the train station, uh, bought a ticket. Or if he was lucky, uh, some rich friend might give him the use of a private car. Well, we've had a number of questions this morning of people interested in James Garfield's military career. And that's what's depicted in the case we're at now. Suzanne Miller, why don't you take over and tell us some of the highlights here? Um, in this, we have the um, trunk that he would have stored his, his personal belongings and carried this um, with him from, from campaign to campaign. Um, 
There is also his gun, his 45 Colt revolver at, at the top here. Um, everything in here is original except for this um, tan pith helmet, and that is a reproduction of the original. And one of the more interesting things in here are these spurs. He, um, he loved his horses, and uh, as a, an officer, he couldn't um, really fraternize with the enlisted men, so he would seek the company of his horses. And his favorite horse during the Civil War was Billy. Billy was shot during his famous or infamous ride during Chickamauga. And the contemporary accounts of that battle of the day was that Billy was killed. Well, look, um, Garfield wrote to his mother about this battle and said that Billy was only shot and he loved him all the more for it. For Dr. Alan Peskin and for Suzanne Miller, let's take a call about James Garfield next from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. You're on the air. Hi, um, I'm a native of Maine and uh, in Garfield cabinet there was also another native of Maine, uh, Governor Blaine. I was wondering what kind of role he might have played um, during the Garfield and uh, Arthur administration and uh, also his relationship with uh, Roscoe Conklin. I'll hang Thank up. Thank you. Here. We've talked a bit, uh, Dr. Peskin, about Roscoe Conklin, so how about telling us more about James G. Blaine? James Blaine was probably the most gifted political leader of his generation, uh, former newspaper editor uh, from Maine, as was pointed out. He and Conkling were not only great rivals, the men never spoke to each other, uh, literally. Even when they were riding in the same railroad carriage, Conkling would say something to somebody else. Uh, would you tell Senator Blaine this? And Blaine would then speak to, uh, again through an intermediary. Uh, they took their feud seriously in those days. Uh, Blaine was Secretary of State in the Garfield administration and the strong man, not only in the Republican Party, but in the administration as well. Uh, had he had Garfield lived, Blaine would have remained as Secretary of State and would have tried to work out uh, what he called his Pan-American policy, which was really opening up closer relationships to what we'd call today the Third World, uh, mainly uh, Latin America and parts of Asia. Uh, but of course, Garfield's assassination ended that because when Conkling's friend uh, Arthur became president, Garfield, uh, Blaine, who was Garfield's friend, was out. Uh, but he got his chance later on in the Benjamin Harrison administration uh, to be Secretary of State again. Well, here in the Visitor Center, Suzanne Miller and I are going to move along since we're talking about politics to the part of the exhibit that looks at his politicking for the White House. As we do that, uh, Alan Peskin, would you talk about the size of a president's cabinet in the 1880s? The President's Cabinet was just bare bones, uh, it was Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, those were the big jobs, Secretary of War, Secretary of Navy, uh, Attorney General, Secretary of the Interior, and that was it. Uh, this had to be balanced very carefully, you had to balance it among the various factions of the party, you had to get the, uh, the various states represented, uh, you had to get people who were veterans, people who uh, had interests in other directions. Uh, putting the uh, cabinet together was very much like putting together a jigsaw puzzle, and I see that I left out Attorney General. Uh, but uh, um, the jigsaw puzzle consumed Garfield's time from the day of his election to the night of his inauguration, trying to put uh, those, that handful of offices together in the best way that would strengthen the Republican Party uh, and reward each faction and, and each state. Our next telephone call on James Garfield comes from Wickless, Ohio. Uh, Hello, you're hello. on the air. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm enjoying this series very much, and thank you. I've watched them all. And I'm wondering, uh, are there any Garfield descendants still in the Cleveland area? And if so, do they take any interest in Lawnfield? Um, yes, there are um, quite a few Garfield descendants in the Cleveland area as well as in the east. Um, a little interest, but not a great deal. When you had the rededication ceremonies for this house, you invited descendants. How many showed up? Over 100. Over 100, and many still bearing the name Garfield. Oh, absolutely. And absolutely. are there any James Garfields alive? Uh, there's, there, I think there's one James A. And there are uh, several James R. And they all, a lot of them incorporate um, family names into their names. Rudolph or, or Abram or James, Edward. Yeah. Making their Definitely. connection with their ancestors. Absolutely. Well, this is about politics. And those who were with us from the beginning heard about the fact that James Garfield was nominated on the 36th ballot at the Republican convention and that presidents in those days campaigned from their home. And this is what you depict here. Tell us more about this. Um, we have here some political cartoons, and um, when 
when someone looks at these things, if they think politics is dirty today, it was just as dirty or worse then. Um, one of them that I'd like to point out since we're, we've been discussing the credit mobilier is this one right here where um, Garfield is uh, shown as being an, a pregnant, unwed mother, and it says forbidding the bands. The bride Garfield, but it was such a little one, referring to the only hundred, the three hundred and twenty-nine dollars, and that's um, of course was not socially acceptable to be an Edwin mother in those days. And then over here we have um, an original cap that would have been worn by these campaign marchers, and then original torch that would have been at the end of their of their rifles. Alan Peskin, would you explain how the torchlight parades worked for candidates? Uh, politics, even in those days, was a branch of show business. Um, and the torchlight parades, which uh, were spectacular with the uh, sort of eerie flickering lights, uh, would, uh, would make a spectacle. Uh, other times, the candidates would uh, appear in, uh, uh, would be honored by parades uh, in the daylight, uh, or in uh, the case of Lawnfield, uh, people would come uh, from the railroad, march from the railroad station in parades, uh, uh, all bearing, sometimes wearing identical clothes, uh, or in one case on a rainy day when a group of, a uh, couple of, a whole trainload of women uh, came to visit him. Uh, Garfield was delighted to see what he called a mile of umbrellas, black umbrellas just bobbing uh, all the way down to the railroad station. Uh, politics was entertainment then. Uh, it's entertainment now. Uh, it wasn't such a disaster or such a surprise that a movie star should become president because the conjunction of politics and showbiz has been uh, very close ever since the campaign of 1840, which I'm sure some of your uh, listeners remember from a few weeks ago, uh, William Henry Harrison's campaign. And for those of you who are modern-day collectors of political buttons, there are a few on display from the era here. Can you talk about the, what people wore? Um, generally, they were small metal buttons or really small metal um, pin with a, a portrait within it. And then, of course, the campaign ribbons were also quite popular. And these are other types of ephemera that would have been available during the campaign. And let's take a telephone call on James Garfield from Irmo, South Carolina. Good morning, Susan. Good morning. I've got two questions for you this morning. I'm really enjoying the series. Number one, uh, the room where Dr. Peskin is sitting in the corner there is a little section that Lucretia had built to hold President Garfield's papers. And I was wondering if you were actually going to show that room, that little section of the room to us today. We and will. Right after the break, we'll start there. Good. And number two, um, I know next week you're going to be doing President Arthur, but it's always interesting in your series to hear the different historians' variety of viewpoints on issues and personalities. And I was wondering if uh, Dr. Peskin could tell us what President Garfield's relationship was with Vice President Arthur both before and during his short presidency. Thank you. Dr. Peskin? Well, as I suggested before, they didn't have much relationship at all. Arthur, in fact, was uh, living in a rooming house uh, with Conkling, uh, who was Garfield's great rival. Uh, and Arthur actually worked to undermine the Garfield administration uh, while he was vice president. Uh, so that uh, Garfield and Arthur had very little to do with each other. Once Garfield died, though, and Arthur became president on his own, Arthur broke with Conkling and became his own man, not Conkling Stooge. We are, Suzanne Miller and I are in the Visitor Center, and that's open and available to you as you start your tour in Menor, Ohio. We're going to move along to the next stage of the exhibit as we do. How many people have visited since you uh, reopened the, the house? Uh, between June 20th of 1998 and June 20th of 1999, we had over 33,000 visitors our first year. Is there a single spot on this campus, which is about eight acres, which is of greatest interest to people, have you found? At the library. And why is that? I think because it's, it's friendly. The light-colored wood is friendly, it's inviting. Our intent in restoring the house was to create the home of James A. Garfield, not the house. So I think we've accomplished that because so many people f say that they just feel so comfortable coming into the house and that they could just move right in, they could sit right down, and they could just be at home. 
The place where we are right now depicts the Garfield's very brief time in the White House. And as we look at some of the artifacts in this case here, let's listen to Indianapolis. Uh, good morning. I'm calling morning. from Crawfordsville, Indiana. And I'd like to say you were talking about how to keep young children interested. I'm a homeschool mom of a nine-year-old and a six-year-old. And uh, we take tours of presidential homes and tombs. We were uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, visiting Zachary Taylor's tomb as C-SPAN was taping down there on May 31st. We ended up our tour at the Garfield home, and we just were so blessed. We couldn't stop thinking about all the things we learned there. And uh, being from Crawfordsville, Indiana, General Lou Wallace wrote uh, Ben-Hur here, and we learned there at the Garfield home that he loved the novel so much that he appointed General Wallace as a, an ambassador to India in hopes of inspiring more writing. I wondered if, you're, um, if anyone knew about that would like to comment. And thank you so much. We love your series. Well, thank you. Dr. Peskin, can you add anything for that caller? She, uh, she's right, General. Uh, it was Turkey, though, not India, and uh, uh, minister to Turkey. But he did that deliberately, hoping that Wallace could pick up material for another novel there on, uh, on the government's payroll. <laughs> And while that homeschooler is just off the line, let me remind you that there are teaching materials available uh, for classroom teachers, and if you're a homeschooler and you can send us some uh, documents about that, the materials will be available for you free as well. C-SPAN makes them available at this telephone number, 202-626-4858, 202-626-4858. And the folks who work in our Educational Services Union are on hand to tell you about how to get your teaching materials. And there's also a web address that is available on the screen. Well, let's have Suzanne Miller talk about one item in this case from the White House days, and that's the brooch. Uh, this was commissioned by her husband, James, and um, presented to her, and after his death, she wore it continuously. It was always at the base of her throat, and it just kept her very close to her husband, which is what she wanted. And you have a number of photographs of her wearing that? Uh, we, have, we have at least one. Exactly. And if John Kelly, who's on the camera there, can just uh, move a little bit over to the right and show the deathbed scene that you have right next door to this, perhaps you can talk about what you've tried to depict here. Um, this would have been when he got it, when he was taken to Elberon and um, Lucretia was by his side, and she would actually read to him daily accounts of, in the newspaper and 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 read to him uh, probably from novels and various other sundry things because they always read to each other. So this is um, this would have been in his final days. Um, he, you can see, he was emaciated. His hands are very thin, and Lucretia was just the devoted wife. Dr. Peskin, in our first segment, you talked about uh, how the fact that this wound was fatal, even though he lingered for, for quite a while. Was he always ill, or did he have periods of recovery? There were ups and downs, but uh, it, the downs were always a little bit lower than the previous downs. Uh, some of the doctors actually had uh, persuaded themselves that there was going to be a miraculous recovery. Uh, but. Uh, they were deluding themselves. That uh, there was no chance of that. Uh, the public followed these bulletins on an almost hourly basis and were given uh, reports of his temperature, his blood, uh, his pulse rate, and uh, other vital signs. And sometimes there were improvements. Uh, sometimes he almost uh, died right on them, and then pulled himself up because he was a very strong man and had a great deal, great strength of will and a very strong constitution. But 80 days of that uh, simply wasted him away. Next telephone calls from Everett, Pennsylvania. Good morning and thank you. I have in front of me, this is a copy of a book written by General James A. Brisbane in 1880, The Early Life and Public Career of James A. Garfield mentioning that he has not written it in any spirit of political partisanship, but merely to give his countrymen a true account of the life and character of our fellow citizen, James A. Garfield. It was apropos that you just passed the case concerning political campaign information. We were discussing earlier uh, about the front porch campaigns, and if this type of book was distributed widely, uh, does Ms. Miller or Dr. Peskin know of this book? And I would like to ask a question and some comments on the information in it. One comment uh, concerning the convention, a Senator B.K. Bruce, a black man from Mississippi, uh, 
a, there was a small group who were wanting him as vice president. The author mentions that the attempt was met with little encouragement. It was not time for a parti colored ticket, but apparently not yet arrived. Uh, also, in Garfield's letter of acceptance of his nomination, he mentions a few things that he's interested in taking care of, safe shipping on the Mississippi, concerning Chinese immigration on the Pacific Coast, and reform, of course, of the patronage and civil service situations. Could you both comment on those, please? Thank you very much. Suzanne Miller, is that early biography something you've come across before? Uh, yes, it is. We have uh, quite a few biographies that were written during his campaign era and then post-mortem, and um, it, they're all alike. They're very interesting to read, and they give a, a real good depiction of just the, the, the general public feeling about Garfield and his era. While we're talking about that, you've got a gift shop here that's filled with uh, artifacts, books, and the like that people yes. can buy. Mm -hmm. What's in it, and how do they find you? Um, we are, we have, we try to keep our, our, our gift shop with a sort of a patriotic presidential vict and some Victorian um, uh, items in it. Um, you mean, how do we, how do people uh, get what's here? What's the phone number? Oh, the phone number. <laughs> it's 440-255-8722. Would you give that one more time? 440-255-8722. And someone can talk you through the kinds of books and other things that are available if you're someone who collects that information. Exactly. Well, Dr. Peskin, I'm going to ask you if you would answer the question about uh, the convention and BK Bruce. And as you do that, Suzanne Miller and I will go to our final stop in the Visitor Center. First off, I wouldn't take too seriously the disclaimer that that uh, campaign biography was written purely out of uh, an abstract love of, of history. It was a campaign document that was financed uh, by the party. Uh, as for Blanche Bruce, uh, he was the first black to be uh, nominated for either vice president or president, uh, or to receive votes for either president or vice president by a major party. Uh, in part, it was a protest against the uh, nomination of Arthur, but in part also it was because the Republican Party was still somewhat committed uh, to the uh, preservation of the position of the freedmen in, in the South. Uh, Bruce did fairly well. Uh, he didn't get a majority of the votes. Garfield didn't encourage his nomination, it's true, but Garfield didn't encourage Arthur's nomination either. Uh, the vice president in those days was chosen by the convention. The notion that the president, presidential candidate, should actually have the nerve to tell the convention who they should choose for vice president was something that was totally foreign in those days. Uh, it's only been since, I suppose, Franklin Roosevelt's time uh, presidential nominees have actually picked their vice president. Our final stop in the Garfield uh, National Historic Site Visitor Center is actually a death mask, which is a Victorian custom. Would you talk us through how these were made and used during the time? Um, a death mask um, dates back to ancient Roman traditions, and that would be life and death masks that were used. Um, the Romans, the more death masks that the Romans had in their homes and in their on their property meant it gave them a, it was a status symbol for the Romans so this was the era when people were able to travel more and so they were picking up all these European traditions and especially the ancient traditions and so this would have been a plaster casting would have been made of his face and then and then the bronze this is a bronze a death mask so it was a, a, the plaster casting was used to make the bronze death mask. And we have heard so many times how James Garfield was a six foot tall robust man and it's very plain to see from the desk, death mask that he became quite emaciated during his final illness uh, after the assassination. Yeah, he lost probably upwards of 80 to 100 pounds. Railroad trains an important part during the period and the last thing to show you is over here in the case because we want to talk about national mourning and you've got a train schedule here. What was this all about? Um, this is called a broadside and this would have been um, a schedule of all the towns in, in the greater Cleveland area where the train was going to stop and so everyone could pay their respects 
in, uh, on its way to Cleveland to its, his final resting place. And people came out all along the line oh, to absolutely. pay their respects and pay homage to the native son of Ohio. Absolutely. As we close here, Suzanne Miller, again, give people visiting information. You are open from what hour to what hour? We are open Monday through Saturday, 10 to 5, Sundays, 12 to 5. And that's every day except six major holidays. And thank you for your hospitality to the caller who said she stopped at one of the sites while we were here. You are most welcome to visit us along the way. At every stop, we have a few of our C-SPAN viewers here, and we are glad to have you along. Check on the website before to see if there are any restrictions about visitation during the hours when we're here, so we don't want you to be disappointed. We're going to be back in the library on the second floor of the Garfield home in just a couple of minutes, and during the break, we will show you the Victoriana depiction of his death. It is the Garfield gravesite in Lakeview Cemetery, and then we'll be back to take more calls on the life and times of James Garfield. At the time that he was assassinated, there was an enormous public uh, outpouring of grief, and there was uh, a group of citizens in Cleveland that got together to raise monies from around the country to build the monument. Uh, it was all done by public subscription of uh, school children and uh, private citizens. No public monies went into the building of this monument. Uh, and they raised $135,000 to put up this building, which um, was designed by George Keller, who's the architect. But you have to know that um, it was considered a monstrosity in its day. And it's really a, a wonderful, beautiful, Romanesque type building with uh, artisans from all over uh, the world contributing to the glory that's in the building. When you come, it's, you have to go up a flight of stairs to the first deck, and you'll see uh, five bas-relief friezes that depict Garfield in his life. Um, he was a, a, a teacher, uh, the president of Hiram College, or what became Hiram College. Uh, he was a, a judge uh, in the military. He was a legislator. Um, he was a preacher. Uh, he did all kinds of things in his life. And so these friezes depict, you know, in a schoolroom, depicts during the Civil War when he was a general. Uh, ri rising to a uh, major general before he mustered out, and um, some of the uh, speeches that he gave during his uh, uh, presidential campaign, especially at Lawnfield, uh, where he was famous for his front porch speeches. And then there's a, um, a freeze on his uh, lying in state. So it's really a, a depiction of his life. After you see the, the freezes, you go into these, uh, through these elegant doors into the inside. And inside are these beautiful mosaics, you know, gold mosaics and other kinds of mosaics. They're very rare. And they form um, beautiful compass points on the, the dome of the, uh, the monument, north, south, east, and west. And what they represent is the outpouring of grief from the all points of the compass in the country. And uh, then you have uh, 13 windows with the 13 original uh, states plus Ohio uh, inside. Some of the windows are in glass, some of them are in mosaic. And then you have two windows to war and peace. So it, it really has a lot of sim uh, Some of the people who visit here, and we have over uh, 400,000 visitors that we've cataloged already or, or measured, uh, they come in and they look at the uh, mosaics and uh, they look at the floor. And in the floor, they, they, their brow furrows and they, they uh, are wondering why we have swastikas in the floor. Well, they're not swastikas. Uh, they're really the Indian symbol for peace. They are the reverse of the swastika that Adolf Hitler took and turned around into war. You also find in, inside this grand sculpture done by Alexander Doyle of uh, President Garfield standing in Congress 
with the uh, exact replica of the chair that he used in the House of Representatives. And uh, it is a, a wonderful sculpture where you can see, you know, all the veins and, and all the, the creases in the clothes and, and things like that. The detail is just beautiful. But again, there's, there's a little story between the, um, the statue and the building, because if you look at the floor on which the statue resides, uh, you can see that the design in the floor was not done with the statue in mind. Uh, and there was a little um, uh, animosity, shall we say, between the uh, statue, the sculpture, and the uh, architect as to whether or not the statue should really go in there because the floor didn't fit it. Well, it eventually went in and uh, nobody cares now, but it's one of those things that was a big thing then. One, one of the things that's very unusual and quite unique is that the casket containing the president's body and another casket containing his wife, Lucretia, are downstairs in a crypt area that can be visited by visitors and there are also two urns down there, one for his uh, son-in-law, Joseph, and his daughter, Molly, uh, who wanted to be buried but could not be buried in full casket, so they were cremated and uh, put in urns down there. And they can be viewed any time. And from the Garfield grave site in Lakeview Cemetery in Cleveland, we return to Menor, Ohio, which is the Garfield National Historic Site and the site of our program about our 20th president. We are in the second floor of this building, which was greatly expanded after President Garfield's assassination by his wife, Lucretia, and she created a library, and in the corner of that library is a vault. One of our callers asked about it during our last segment, and we will show you the vault room that was held Alan Peskin to do what? It was, held to, uh, it was built to hold the Garfield uh, memorabilia, his correspondence, his diary, uh, his letter books, uh, photographs. Uh, Garfield retained all his papers, uh, overdue library notices, and uh, he was a very assiduous writer. He wrote a diary every day, except unfortunately during the presidential campaign. Uh, he believed that it was a matter of honor that every letter sent to him had to be replied to personally. And for that, he only had a part-time uh, secretary. Uh, so that this vault housed much of Garfield's life, really, at least his life in paper. You mentioned earlier that Queen Victoria offered condolences at his death, and her, a wreath she sent is preserved there. Yes, and it, there it is, <laughs> uh, well preserved. Uh, it was on his uh, casket when he was uh, lying in state at, at the Capitol Rotunda and also when he was, uh, uh, when the casket was uh, in Cleveland prior to the burial. Uh, not only Queen Victoria, however, sent him uh, regrets, uh, which were very sincere in her case because her, she was still mourning the death of her own husband, but also uh, the anarchists who had recently shot, uh, or rather blown up, uh, Tsar Alexander of Russia sent Lucretia regrets, saying that if they were Americans, they would never have shot a president, uh, only Tsars. John Shaw, where are Garfield's papers today? Well, all the papers are with the presidential papers in the Library of Congress, but an interesting thing uh, showing the vault, um, all of the papers went um, in the 1900s and 1920s except these personal letters between James and Lucretia. These were kept by the family until 1964, before they were released uh, into the public domain. And why do you think that was? Well, I think that, that they meant so much to Lucretia, the, who would have been the grandmother uh, for the Garfield children uh, later on, um, that they were reluctant to have them read. They do contain things, uh, items of, of uh, some embarrassment, not very much, but some embarrassment about uh, little jealousies of Crete uh, and perhaps uh, James's uh, uh, roving a bit. 
Uh, and so they're not entirely complementary. But Lucretia did not destroy a single one of the letters. She kept them all, and she also uh, dated them and uh, took great care of them. John Shaw's book, Crete and James, is available in bookstores, as is the book written by our other guest, Alan Peskin. It is called Garfield, and it is a biography of our 20th president. We have about 20 minutes left, and we're going to try to get in as many questions as we can from you during that time period. Let's go to Willow Wick, Ohio. Go ahead, caller. Hi. Please go ahead. We can hear you. Hi. I was wondering how long it took you to get all the information and clothes into the house. And can you tell us how old you are? I'm 11. And how, how did you become interested in James Garfield? I was just watching and I thought it was interesting. Have you, you live in Ohio. Have you ever been to this home? Yeah. And what did you think? I thought it was cool. Do you remember one thing in particular that you saw here? I just liked all the monuments and everything. Great. Well, thank you for your call. I'm glad to have an 11-year-old participating. The question was how long it took to find all of the, the things that are collected in this house here. By uh, the, uh, the curators of the house? Oh, I think they've uh, been working on this ever since, uh, ever since Garfield lived here in 1880. But uh, it was Mrs. Garfield who lived here until the 1920s who did most of the collection and most of the additions. Then after that, her children uh, lived here, at least had summer homes here, and they kept the stuff intact until the 1930s when they decided that it was simply too expensive and a depression to maintain and then it's been held by historical societies so that really they haven't had to do much collection uh, because everything was maintained. Uh. Behind our guests' heads are books belonging to James Garfield and his family. Uh, in fact, the number that they use in the brochures and material, 80 percent of all the artifacts in this house are from James Garfield's time. It was restored to the period 1880-1905. Next call is from Lakeland, Florida. Hello. Thank you very much for this President series. Really appreciate it. I'm calling because there was uh, earlier in the program a reenactor called in and wanted to know who reported the hole in the line at Chickamauga. And I have uh, a book that states it was Captain Sanford C. Kellogg, a good soldier from New York, who worked for General Thomas. He reported it, and General Rosecrans sent two aides to check it, and I said, oh, yes, there's a hole in the line. However, James Garfield was the only one that knew there was not a hole in the line, and he was so important that <laughs> Rosecrans never, ever issued an order ordinarily through anyone else but him. But he wasn't in the area. He didn't know that you know anything about this, so he issued the order to someone else, and uh, it, it was a disaster for the for the North. But of course, it it, it was great for the South. <laughs> but that's that's the names uh, involved. General Wood was ordered to move through somebody who didn't know the whole situation. Thank you for your call. Clarifies our earlier discussion. Appreciate it. We have not spent a great deal of time on a very important part of James Garfield's political life, and that is his career in Congress. His congressional desk sits in this library room. We'll show it to you, and uh, perhaps you can tell us about those many years in Congress and what the important aspects of it were. Gar no? Garfield spent 17 years in Congress. Uh, he was elected almost uh, automatically by this uh, district in northern Ohio. Uh, which was so a solidly Republican district. This uh, 17 years may not seem like a lot today, but uh, in the 19th century it was very rare for a congressman to have more than two terms. So that Garfield accumulated a great deal of seniority and a great deal of knowledge of the inner workings of the government during his 17 years in Congress, particularly as chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, which had to uh, supervised the expenditure of every penny so that when he became president he probably knew the government from the inside out better than anybody since John Quincy Adams I suspect. Maura Pierce is our producer for this stop of James Garfield. Jim Clark is directing our program this morning and Sherry Sanders Smith is our technical director for our production here. John Shaw, that time in Congress when all the family was finally together, did you see a change in the ups and downs in the relationship between Lucretia and James at that time? Oh yes. Uh, I think the most important moment 
came when uh, James decided to build a house in Washington at 13th and I Street. They built this in uh, 1869, and at that time Lucretia wrote to him and she said, I feel more a bride than I did when we were first married. And she said, at last you have taken your wife to your hearth and heart in one of her letters about the house because that meant that they would be together all the time and none of the uh, long and, and very painful separations that they had had in the earlier marriage. 200 days in office, our 20th president, and he is memorialized in Washington, D.C. During our uh, next telephone call, we're going to show you the uh, place in Washington where there is a Garfield statue, and uh, if we have a call ready, we can take that as well. Angola, Indiana, you are on the air. Yes, hello. I'm calling from Angola, Indiana, but I was born in Garrettsville, Ohio, and I have a question for Professor Shaw. My father is Orson Ott and uh, knows well the Masonic Lodge in Garrettsville where Garfield was. I've been a, a guest just recently in the home of the Zimmermans in Hiram. I was delighted to go there. We have always heard the legend that James Garfield could uh, write Greek with one hand and Latin with the other at the same time. We know he was a wonderful scholar. Any truth to that long-held rumor in Garrettsville and Hiram? Oh, uh, well, I'm glad to hear from you. and I was a great admirer of your father. Um, I don't think I can answer that question. I've heard the, uh, the, the uh, statement before about it, and I believe it, but I'm not sure that it's true. Uh, Gar <laughs> uh, shortly after his death, Garfield's, uh, after Garfield's death, one of his sons tried to track that legend down uh, because he had heard it, but he had never seen it happen. And he wrote to lots and lots of people, relatives, friends, family, <laughs> and none of them supported it. It's true that Garfield was ambidextrous, but he just wasn't that ambidextrous. <laughs> All of the videotape that we've been showing you this morning from various sites uh, is a great deal of work as well, and we have some thank yous that we need to uh, and want to mix in. Kermit Pike and Barbara Billings at the Western Reserve Historical Society in Cleveland, and Sandra Brown at the Moreland Hills, Ohio Village Hall, which is the site of Garfield's birthplace, both very helpful in helping us assemble this record of our 20th president. Next call is Eugene, Oregon. You're on the air. Yes, I'd like to ask about General Winfield Scott Hancock, the 1880 Democratic presidential nominee. Uh, he did quite well in that election, came close to defeating Garfield. And we hear a lot about the uh, turmoil within the Republican Party that led up to Garfield's nomination. But what were the issues in the fall campaign? And uh, were members of the Grand Army of the Republic uh, attempted to abandon their republicanism to support General Hancock? Some were tempted, but uh, they managed to resist the temptation because by this time the Republican Party had become the real vehicle of veterans' uh, aspirations. Uh, the issues in the campaign, the issues of the campaign were mainly refighting the, the battles of the Civil War, uh, with Hancock unfortunately representing what was regarded as the wrong side, even though he was a Union general. By the end of the campaign, however, the issues had switched to the uh, more modern issues of the tariff and of economic policy and in this Hancock proved to be uh, somewhat out of touch because his military experience hadn't prepared him for the details of economic policy and uh, public affairs. Uh, he was made fun of because he said that the tariff was purely a local question but actually, that was a very profound remark, if looked at <laughs> profoundly. And uh, Garfield himself had said something along those lines earlier. But as Dan Quayle had discovered earlier, uh, had, would discover later, once you get the image of a uh, lightweight attached to you, it's very hard to shed it. And Hancock had that trouble. C-SPAN's cable affiliate in this area of Ohio bringing our programming to the folks who live here is Media One. And we thank them for their help. Next call, Waco, Texas. I just cannot understand you. Can, can, can you explain what your point is? What, what, what don't you understand? What? What's your question? I'm sorry. I guess I'm I just not understanding. I guess I better just hang up. All right. Thank you for trying. We appreciate it. Winfield, Illinois, next. Uh, yes, Winfield, uh, not named after Winfield Hancock, but we think Winfield uh, Scott. Anyway, Probably. I had um, uh, two questions. One is whether the assassination site of President Garfield is marked in uh, Washington. Is it uh, somewhere in the Union Station or is it elsewhere? And secondly, earlier in the program, you had shown a very unusual black
black chair that they said the school children comment on, but there's nothing uh, more about it. But I wonder if you could tell us something about that. It's an unusual shape. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll show you the chair, which was in the, the room left intact. Do you know any more about it? Except nothing except it looks terribly uncomfortable. <laughs> but, uh, uh, we learned earlier that this was the president's study, and Lucretia kept the room intact after his death. And his uh, question was about the train station in Washington. Yes, well, it's not the Union Station. It was the Baltimore and Potomac Station. And uh, the Baltimore Potomac Depot has since been torn down. And in fact, the railroad doesn't even exist. Whether there's a marker there or not at, at the site, I'm not sure. I've never seen it, nor have I read about it. And you're probably right that Winfield, Indiana, is named after the original Winfield Scott, not Winfield Scott Hancock. And since I'm writing a biography of Winfield Scott, uh, I'll, uh, I like to see the connection between the two projects that I've done. Are there any Garfield uh, cities? Oh, there's Garfield them? Townships, cities of Garfield, Garfield Heights in Cleveland. There's a mountain in the Rockies named after Garfield, Mount Garfield. Um, quite a bit uh, of memory uh, to uh, memorialize him by. John Shaw, I know that many generations have gone by, but reading these papers, do you think you would have liked these people? I think I would have liked both of them. And I think that I would have, have been a little bit frightened of Lucretia. And I think I would have loved James Garfield. Can I just read just a, one little quote here? Uh, this is after a campaign speech by Garfield. It took place about 1870 here in Ohio. And uh, after eating all of this food, uh, this is written by uh, Mrs. Henry, Charles Henry's uh, wife. Uh, she says, General Garfield, Harry Rhodes, and Charlie Henry reclined upon the grassy slope through the warm autumn afternoon. They smoked and plied each other with schoolboy raillery and uproarious jest until now and again they rolled over and over upon the ground and and stirred the very trees with their Olympian laughter. And I think that shows a lot about what a great guy Garfield was, uh, just as a friend and a pal. We have two Ohio calls in line. Next is Chester Land, Ohio. Yeah, good morning. I, I good have morning. a question and a comment. I was on a recent tour of the Garfield Mansion, inspired by C-SPAN, and the question came up as to Garfield's view of, of Abraham Lincoln as a lawyer. That Garf the Garfield, just a very fledgling type of lawyer, we have was not very high in esteem of holding Abraham Lincoln as a lawyer. And then I have one comment about, but a remark that uh, Professor Pishkin, I believe his name is, made. And I think this was brought true uh, to all of us by the C-SPAN series, that one thing we're learning, that these presidents are just remarkable people. They're not just legends, they're not just mysteries, they are people. Thank you. Thank you for your call about Lincoln? Oh, uh, Garfield didn't think too much of Lincoln. He called him a second-rate prairie lawyer. Uh, but he later on uh, felt that God had chosen a second-rate prairie lawyer to be his instrument of uh, saving the Union, freeing the slaves. Uh, so that uh, posthumously, at least, his opinion of Lincoln improved substantially. There are all sorts of Lincoln artifacts around this house. Every room has at least one, it seems. Would that have been typical for a Republican who followed in his footsteps? Yes. Yes, Lincoln by this time had become the patron saint of the party. Uh, during his lifetime, he, he was regarded uh, a, with a little suspicion, particularly by the people that uh, Garfield was most closely associated with, Sam and P. Chase uh, and uh, Henry Winter Davis and others. John Shaw, I'm going to ask you in your book, uh, and I have it flagged and I can't find it, but you, there are a few lines written by Garfield in his personal description after seeing Lincoln. I wonder if you might be able to find that for us, and we'll listen to Lincoln in the words of Garfield after our next call. Yeah, sure. Chillicothe, Ohio. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Joy Goff, calling from the birthplace of Lucy Webb Hayes. So, yes, the presidents were interesting, and then the Ohio ones I've been studying for 30 years, and their wives as fascinating and very faithful. <laughs> I have, my question is, was Garfield, uh, as a young boy working on the uh, canals, I recall there was a rather strong boy that was, used to get preference of, of right away. And is, was it not James Garfield? Um, 
he was in a number of fights on the Erie Canal, on the Ohio Canal, uh, and uh, usually won them. Uh, it was the canal was not a uh, high status occupation. These were roughnecks, and uh, they were looked down upon. And Garfield was, at least in this stage of his life, a very tough, unruly, and in some ways undisciplined boy. He was saved by religion, school, and mother. Fairfax, Virginia. Go ahead, caller. You're on the air. Oh, hello, Susan. I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Peskin. Uh, he mentioned that Salmon Chase had been on the $10,000 bill. I just wanted to ask him if he was aware that President Garfield had appeared on, on uh, United States currency. What denomination? Uh, it's the gold certificate, $20 of 1882. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, but next time I, I have one in my wallet, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it. Thank you. We always appreciate our callers for adding more to our knowledge base here. Well, John Shaw has found the citation of Lincoln by Garfield. Uh, this is in uh, February of 1861. Lincoln went through Columbus, Ohio on his way uh, to Washington. He says, of course, uh, I, in some respects I was disappointed in Lincoln, but in most he surpasses expectation. He has raised a pair of whiskers not, but notwithstanding all their beautifying effects, he is distressedly homely. But through all his awkward homeliness, there is a look of transparent, genuine goodness, which at once reaches your heart and makes you trust and love him. His visits are having a fine effect on the country. Thank you for that. Next, Dallas, Texas. Go ahead, Dallas. Ah, uh, yes, I've got a question about education. As a teacher, I just wondered if... Uh, Mr. Garfield faced any issues involving public education and if he was able to impact them during his brief tenure. Mm -hmm. Garfield was responsible for establishing the Federal Department of Education, um, which wasn't a cabinet level department in his day, uh, but uh, a sub cabinet level uh, uh, agency, we'd call it now. Uh, and that was his doing. And uh, most congressmen. Uh, considered it to be his baby, but it only lasted uh, for a few years and got involved in partisan politics, and then the department uh, faded away to be replaced uh, much, much later by a cabinet-level department. Yes, he did uh, lobby very hard for education. Also, our thanks to Mary Kramer and Bill Garrison at the Lakeview Cemetery, which is the site of the Garfield gravesite. And very special thanks to the National Park Service and the uh, Western Reserve Hus Historical Society for all their hospitality here, especially Suzanne Miller and Steve Roberts. Uh, we really do take over a place like this when we come to do these productions, and they've been so helpful. We've got four minutes left. Next telephone call is from Al Hamilton, Ohio. Hi, Susan. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for your call. Thank you. It's an honor to talk to you and uh, Mr. Paskin. I've been reading your book, um, Garfield, on and off for the last few years, and I really love it a lot. It takes a long time to finish, yes. Oh. Yeah, I got it through uh, Eastern Press. It's leather-bound, gold leaf, okay. and I really love it a lot. Um, I just wanted to talk more about President Garfield's presidency, uh, about the Star, Star Root scandal, and uh, also how he, uh, uh, we read it here, how he directed Secretary O. Uh, Wyndham to refund the national debt by calling outstanding United States bonds and issued 16 percent, giving um, giving holders an option of cashing them um, uh, to 3.5 percent, which saved the national debt taxpayers 10 million dollars. And um, I think um, he would have been a decent or great president. And I'll just take my call off the air. And by the way, it's my birthday today, so I thought I'd treat myself to, to call him. Well, thank you for calling on your birthday. Have a happy one. Just briefly, because these are not particularly sexy issues, uh, refunding the national debt through subscription rather than through bankers' syndicates did save the uh, government money and also gave the public a greater uh, stake in, uh, in financing in the country's finances. Uh, the earlier issue, the Star Route scandal, is associated with Garfield's name because it was uncovered and prosecuted during Garfield's administration, but the scandal involving the Post Department really took place in the Hayes administration, and Garfield's hands were clean on that. John Shaw, have you been to this house before? Yes. And what's a favorite spot for you here? This library. I love this room. I think it uh, is such a uh, spacious and warmly accepting room, and I think it's just uh, a lovely spot. 
And unfortunately, one that the president himself never saw. Never is that saw. Correct? I think it was 1895 uh, that it was uh, built. Our time is rapidly evaporating on us. And one last thank you. That's to our uh, special production assistants today, the Chapmans, visiting us from Ohio. Farmington, Michigan, you're our last caller on James Garfield. Yes, my name is Ann from Farmington. And um, the previous to the 1996 election, on C-SPAN, there was a panel discussing um, how it should be t determined when the vice president should take over because of physical problems for the president. And I wondered if you could evaluate how capable um, Garfield was while he was so ill and if there's anything that should be done presently regarding a president's illness and uh, at what point and who determines when the vice president takes over. Thank you. An important question. Well, uh, Garfield was uh, shot at the beginning of the summer and Congress wasn't in session. And he died at the end of the summer before Congress came back into session. And it was a wonderful thing about America in the 19th century that it didn't need government during the summer. It could just keep on going. So all Garfield did was sign a few, uh, a few papers uh, and he was barely able to do that. And otherwise the country didn't miss him. So the constitutional omission was really not noticed at that point? Not a bit. Uh, country just went along without him. In our last uh, few seconds, a man who was in office for, for just uh, 200 days, all told, and many of those at his deathbed, did he have a legacy? Yes, he had a legacy, but the legacy, I think, was more in his life than in his presidency. The life that demonstrated that you could rise from poor boy to president, that you could become learned, that you could become pious, that you could become a soldier, uh, that you could live by the verities of the 19th century and, and succeed. Uh, this was what uh, made Garfield such a hero to uh, Americans at his time, not his brief presidency. And next week, Chester Alon, Arthur, very briefly, take us into that era. What did he inherit? He inherited an administration that uh, presided over a very divided Republican Party, a party that was split down the middle as Garfield's 36 ballots demonstrated, and he had the job of trying to put that party back together, and I don't think succeeded. We'll be live from uh, Union College in Schenectady, New York, for our program on Chester Arthur, and that is Friday, August 6th. From Menor, Ohio, we want to thank you for your participation this morning in our program about our 20th president, uh, James Garfield, and a special thanks to Alan Peskin and John Shaw for being with us for our two and a half hours to discuss the life and times of James A. Garfield. Thank you, gentlemen.